Members of Council, if I can please have you take your seats. This meeting is now resumed. Members, uh, we have a presentation this morning to recognize the staff involved in the emergency incident at 260 Wellesley Street East. I would like to call upon the mayor to come forward for the presentation. And I, in turn, uh, Madam Speaker, if I could, could ask when she's uh, available to, for Councillor Wong Tam to come up because she's going to join me in just saying a few words. And uh, I went over there to visit with our distinguished uh, visiting delegation that we're uh, paying tribute to today and uh, said if they're all here, who's looking after the city? But the bottom line is that uh, fortunately there are, there are lots more where uh, they came from. But we have some people here today who, uh, again, and this is nothing new, but I think it's worthy, and certainly Councillor Wong Tam felt the same way, worthy of recognizing uh, the efforts made by this group of people and many of their colleagues in dealing with a difficult situation that arose at uh, 260 uh, well Wellesley Street uh, last week and there were various things going on in surrounding buildings as you know we already had the issues going on with 650 Parliament and then there were some some of the adjacent buildings had other issues that didn't get as much uh, public attention but uh, yet again what we saw was um, a fantastic team effort uh, to protect people at the end of the day. That's really what it was all about, is to keep them safe. And so I just wanted to sort of mention that, and the, I hope they're all represented here today, but if it, in no particular order, you had people from right across all kinds of city divisions and services. Toronto Hydro, for example, had to c disconnect the power. We wish they didn't have to do that because that was at the genesis of a lot of the challenges that we faced in terms of everything from elevators to, uh, to uh, you know, pumping the water. Uh, and as you know, this all arose out of a... Uh, a flood that happened because of a burst pipe which uh, flooded the electrical room which put the electrical equipment in, at risk. So Toronto Hydro had to do that uh, and uh, city staff then uh, really uh, started to fulfill a whole bunch of other uh, uh, roles in keeping people safe and making sure that we got the situation uh, in hand as quickly as possible. Uh, Deputy Fire Chief Jim Jessup, if I had to say there was somebody who sort of just took over that sort of the sort of the management of of, of uh, the situation uh, it, we, it was obvious that he was that person and uh, deputy chief a particular uh, thanks to you for your leadership in that regard and one of the first things he did was to make sure that toronto fire uh, received uh, or issued orders against the building owners to bring in security guards and do a number of things that again were all devoted to keeping people uh, safe and those orders were done in in short order um, I learned last term in an incident that happened at Thorncliffe Park where they were without water for I think 36 hours that uh, when you're sort of perplexed about what to do uh, in a situation and you don't know exactly who to call, call the fire department because um, they usually have some kind of an idea as to something they can do with their equipment or their expertise or whatever to try and uh, make these things good. And we saw there that in the challenge, I mean, you know, like not to get too granular about it, but the fact is these are the realities of people's lives that we can get them bottled water to drink. But when it comes to being able to do something as basic as flushing your toilet, if you can make water available to people on the floor when you can't, when there is no water coming up through the system and so forth, uh, and again, our, our fire service through charging up some of the pipes and so on uh, made that kind of thing possible so that people could have a somewhat more civilized existence for the period of time while we waited to see if the building uh, systems could get fixed. Uh, and the fire department just know how to get things done. And I will just say throughout the period, and I'm sure that Councillor Wong Tam will, will confirm this, that the fire department people never took their eye off the ball. They were just there to kind of keep people safe, first and foremost, knock on the doors, be on the floors, help with the water, uh, and, and so forth and so on. Um, that is not to diminish in any way the uh, efforts of, of all the other people involved. And that includes, of course, uh, the emergency management office, and they're represented here today. Um, and they did a great job doing some of the other end of this, which is that we had to have available uh, a warming center. And I, I thank, in particular, the people at the Wellesley uh, Community Center, because not once but twice they've been called upon to uh, help us. And we're obviously very sensitive, and, and the councillor played a very leading role in making, sure, in making sure that we were sensitive as we utilized some of those facilities to the needs, of course, of the neighbours who use the community centre all the time and 
those needs don't go away just because we have a particular emergency situation. Uh, and uh, we had 1,500 people here who needed help, and I'd say a minority of them ended up going to the community center, but nonetheless, it was there uh, for them. And a warming center was set up, and I want to thank the staff at that center uh, for their help once again. The TTC helped us. They had buses uh, there to operate again as kind of warming centers right outside the building in the immediate aftermath and also to help uh, transport people to the Wellesley uh, Community Centre. I mentioned the emergency uh, management to people who, as you'd expect, um, you know, kept a, an ongoing role together with the Red Cross and so forth in just making sure the basic needs of people were met as we went through and that there was a coordination in, in particular of uh, communication of information to people. Uh, the communications staff of the city made sure that uh, I think we've learned some lessons about that from unfortunately the fact that these things repeat themselves uh, in terms of these kinds of fairly large episodes involving high-rise buildings and I think the communication was better this time. There were sheets available in advance, some of which thank goodness never had to be used. I mean, there were sheets available for evacuation of the building if that had ever had to happen, and it didn't, but there was a sheet ready explaining to people how that was going to be done. Uh, of course, the police and the paramedics were there every step of the way, and the paramedics, uh, again, the chief is here, and I thank him, the fire chief is also here, um, for the fact that they were checking in on people who we knew from our records and whatnot were people who were vulnerable uh, in that building, checking them continuously because uh, those kinds of people couldn't make it up and down the stairs. There were no elevators at all. And finally, I just want to make mention of the Electrical Safety Authority. It's not a city agency, uh, but they were instrumental in, in doing all the work to make sure that when the power was turned back on, it could be done, it could be done safely, it could be done within all of the uh, requirements. The last person that I want to pay tribute to is the one standing beside me here, and uh, she was a constant presence counselor long time at the building, and that's our job, I mean, to be there. But nonetheless, uh, she went the extra mile, and the thing that I saw for the first time is I saw her conduct a community meeting. And, uh, you know, they have that expression, it obviously wasn't her first rodeo in terms of conducting community meetings. And you know when people's emotions are high because they're frustrated and these are people who have been, uh, had no power in their apartments, we were sort of asking them to stay there because we didn't want to sort of go through trying to evacuate the building in winter and in the night. Um, and it required a lot of uh, a great skill and dexterity at running that community meeting and it was a very calm actually discussion all things considered and that's because she posted these rules and I could tell they were not the first time those rules had been used about how people sort of spoke one at a time but she also conducted that meeting in a way that uh, that was uh, I think helpful to keeping the temperature uh, down so you know I think I really speak for all of us I hope I do and Councillor Wong Tam will, will speak in briefly in a moment and just saying these are the moments that you're proudest to be in city government you know, uh, lots of governments do good things at all different, uh, you know, all different parts of the uh, of, of the system. But uh, you know, we have that responsibility that is so down to earth and so on the ground and so involving people so directly. Um, and I think it was made you a moment to be proud to be working with all these people that are representatives of a great team. They worked well together. Uh, I will say to you that I'm going to be asking the city manager because I think we have to really study these instances now that involve 1,000, 1,500 people as we're building 90-story buildings. And they're a little different today because now they have to have generators to keep at least one elevator going and so on. But nonetheless, if buildings have to be evacuated because they have no water and no hydro, it's a serious problem for us just to sort of suddenly find places to go. And when this is a building of 1,500 or so people, what if it's a 90-story building that has 3,000 people living in it? So I think we've got to take another look at, at how we do that. But nonetheless, in this instance, this team of people and all their colleagues responded magnificently. And I think that it's a source of great pride for all of us that we have these excellent uh, people helping us. And uh, so uh, at the end of uh, Councillor Wong Tam's remarks, I'm sure we'll both want to ask for you to give them a round of applause for their efforts and to say thank you. But I will on my own behalf as mayor say thank you and, and introduce uh, the master uh, conductor of public meetings from all that I've seen, uh, Councillor Wong Tam. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. The, uh, the one person you did not thank was yourself, and I would like to start off with that. Um, the mayor was, uh, was on site uh, immediately. Uh, he was uh, ever so present, and I think his entire team uh, mobilized to make sure that w there was some round of communication. Um, and, uh, and that is what leadership looks like in the, in the face of emergency, and I think you know, uh, we need to also acknowledge the, the mayor's leadership in, in all of this. Um, and of course, the team here is, is nodding. Um, I want to thank uh, 
um, you myself personally on behalf of the residents of, uh, of 260 Wellesley. Uh, it's, a, it's a very trying time for St. Jamestown, I would say, uh, largely because of the dis massive displacement of the fire that took place last summer of 650 Parliament. Uh, so this is a community that has now received about two bouts of, of, of significant citywide bad news. Um, but the news doesn't last for just a moment in time and it's not just a headline. The news has an everlasting impact and they know that their journey to not just being uh, rehoused and uh, making sure that their place is warm and safe again and that they have running water, um, you made it a little bit easier. And I would say that because there was no evacuation, because there was innovation in trying to bring water to each individual floor and making the call to not evacuate, um, kept them housed, even though the, the temperatures were not uh, necessarily the most comfortable. Um, and I, I want to just say that with respect to the vulnerable residents in that building, and you know who they are, uh, because this is a building that has a significant number of newcomers. English is not their first language. Uh, they have struggled in some ways, uh, largely because they've been trying to get their building uh, owner and manager just to be responsive to the day-to-day -day, uh, care and, uh, and state of good repair of their buildings. Um, so when an incident of this magnitude happens, um, and knowing that there was a suite of of, of city team leaders and, and s service delivery people that were on site and that never took their eye on the ball, but also delivered the care with such compassion and in, in such deliberation and purpose, I think that they felt better. And I can honestly say that out of all the concerns that, were, that did come out of those, uh, uh, the incident itself, and it's not easy to be left out in the cold, um, and uh, without heat, without hydro, and without water for, for almost five days, in some cases six days, and, and I, I hear there's maybe a, a one or two units that are still left behind, um, but not because of, of, of anything that you've done or, or did not do. Um, and so for, for that moment in time, um, they knew that they were being cared for, and I don't think that there would be anybody in that building or even the surrounding buildings that said that the city was not there for them. And so I would echo what the mayor had to say, that there are moments in time in government uh, you feel extremely proud of the people that you work with and the people that you work for. Um, and this was certainly this past week, last week, uh, was one of the proudest moments for me uh, as a councillor. So I want to say thank you very much uh, to each and every single one of you. And I know that there's many who are not in the room, because literally it was a 24-hour uh, wraparound uh, uh, effort that lasted close to seven days and still I know that there is uh, administrative matters to take care of moving forward and um, Deputy Chief Jessup and I know Dep uh, Chief uh, Peg um, you folks were at the at the, your, your hands were firmly on that wheel and despite the fact that you you know you were sick fighting your own flu flus um, you showed up every single day and that meant you put service above self and so we owe all of you, including the leadership, uh, our, our, our most heartfelt con congratulations and thank you. Just, uh, we can see where you are, but if you please stand to be recognized, we would like to recognize. Please stand up for all of you there. Just, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, the last thing I'll just mention, and, and we alluded to it both of us several times on the way through, the people were amazingly patient. Uh, you know, the, you, you go to these places, and we've all been in our uh, respective areas, and you see what they're putting up with, and there'd be reason why they might be throwing furniture. And there was a very skillfully conducted community meeting, but people were very patient throughout, and uh, the people who live there. And we're taking up, as you can probably see from a motion that's on the floor of council, trying to help them a little bit with some of the ongoing issues that they have that are not related to this. And, uh, you know, that's just because that's our job, all of us. But uh, the, the people were great, too. But thank you again very much for your service. Thank you. Okay, members of council, we will now review and confirm the order paper. There are 11 items left on the agenda, plus 26 member motions. 
City Council will consider member motions at 2 p.m. I will now take the release of polls. Please put your name on your request to question staff. <coughs> Councillor Cressy. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And I have to reopen this. I mentioned this at the end of day yesterday. I have to reopen an item from yesterday's green sheets. It's not on the blue sheet. It was on yesterday's green sheets. It's page 7, item TE 2.3. That is the 647-663 to 665 King Street West um, demolition application. So I have a request to reopen. Okay, it's, it's on the screen. All in favor? Carried. Okay, and then I have a technical amendment from staff. Uh, there was an incorrect notion of the GFA listed, and so staff have given me this, and this is the reason uh, for the reopening. And with that, I can release it. Okay, on the amendment, on um, favor, carried. Item is amended, on um, favor, carried. Thank you. I've also uh, reviewed an urgent motion to be added to the agenda. Councillor Fletcher. I don't see it there. It's coming. Okay. This is uh, from planning, it's a uh, settlement. All in favor, carried. All those in favor of adopting the order paper. Oh, sorry, Councillor Thompson, I didn't see your name there. Do you have a quick release? In, yes, uh, Speaker, I was in between your uh, remarks there. Um, on page two, I can release uh, TE 2.1. There you go, Jill. <laughs> okay. It's coming. Thank you. I, I don't need a record to vote. I just. Okay, so on page <clears throat> 2, T2.1, permanent closure of a portion of Front Street. On favor? Carried. Uh, the next one is uh, TE2.2, the permanent okay. closure of the T shaped public lane at the railroad 371 Bloor Street West and Washington Avenue. On we favor? Carried. And then finally, uh, TE 2.17, which is the uh, construction staging area, the time extension, Phase 1, Adelaide Street uh, West and uh, Duncan Street. Okay, on page 2, TE 2.17. On favor, carried. Thank you. That's all. Speaker. Thank you. Councillor Carroll. Madam Speaker, I don't have an item to release. It's just the perfect timing because they're sitting watching us on a laptop. Can I just wish Martha Carroll a happy birthday this morning? Thank you. Happy birthday, Martha. <laughs> Thank you. All those in favor of adopting the order paper? Court it. Councillor Mallow, please. Deputy Mayor Minamong, please. Deputy Mayor Minamong, please. The motion to adopt the order paper carries unanimously, 17 in favor. Thank you. So we'll go through our, uh, the first item, uh, which is on page 2, EX 1.2, Toronto Parking Authority, Governance. Uh, Councillor Fillion, you held the item down. Do we have questions to staff? Do we have any questions to staff? This is on the Toronto Parking Authority. No questions? Okay, Councillor Fletcher. Just on page eight of the report, um, it says 
Tories further recommends that in drafting its governance and procedural policy, the TPA chair should seek the assistance of the Office of the Clerk uh, to discuss whether city agency-centered policy could be drafted as a reference to other city agencies who are considering revising their governance framework. Could I just get a little clarification about what that would be, the city agency-centered policy, please? Over there. Good morning. Thank you. Through the chair, um, certainly the agency support uh, from uh, the city manager's office, working with the city clerk's office, is uh, trying to ensure that there's good policy practices across all the agencies and good governance practices as well. So it's uh, it's an ongoing role that we play, and certainly Tories has suggested that. Uh, in an effort to ensure that the governance models that they're recommending are, are laid out, that there's good training and good policies in play, we would continue that relationship. I see. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So that's it for the questions. Councillor Fillion, you held the item down to speak. Uh, thank you. Um, I have a, an amendment to the city manager's report that City Council amend the Executive Committee Recommendation 2 to now read as follows. City Council direct the City Clerk in consultation with the City Manager to recruit a new Board of Directors of the Toronto Parking Authority yes. in accordance with the Public Appointments Policy and Toronto Municipal Cha uh, Code Chapter 179 Parking Authority. And this is the change with the appointment process modified to authorize the City Clerk and City Manager staff to shortlist interview and recommend candidates to the Civic Appointments Committee. Um, I have discussed this change with the city manager and I believe he concurs. Um, we have here an excellent report from the city manager and an excellent report from Tories, which uh, is long. I hope people read it. It's not every day that we receive a report from someone of the stature of Frank Iacobucci. And um, the report highlights uh, um, what went wrong here. Um, and it, you know, and I won't, hopefully most people are familiar with what went wrong here and I won't go into it in any kind of uh, detail, especially in a public forum, but it talks about problems with policies and procedures that need to be completely overhauled and uh, um, that area uh, of governance with the parking authority has been a uh, complete mess and uh, I think we need a really, really solid, strong board in there to completely overhaul all of that. There's another part of, uh, Denzel please, there's another part of um, the report from Tories that um, I think applies to the first part I think applied mainly to the parking authority. The, um, there are parts of the report that really apply to good governance with all of our boards and committees and even this council and it talks about the culture of organizations and it talks about the kind of culture that you need to have good governance. And it talks about a culture where all information needs to be disclosed. This is a good governance culture, is where all information is disclosed. Um, independent thinking is encouraged. Dissent is encouraged. Encouraged. Um, and it's through that, through people asking a lot of questions, getting all the information back, um, having differences of opinion, having those differences respected, that you arrive at the best decisions. And if we think about decisions we've made in this room um, and reflect on the good ones and the bad ones, I think we'll see that the good ones all come out of a healthy decision-making process. The bad ones come out of something where Anybody who disagrees is uh, there's an attempt to squelch that or put a box around the uh, the dissenter and not have a complete open debate with all of the information. So it's a great report. I hope everybody takes the time to read it, and uh, hopefully 
Um, we certainly have great procedures and policies here, I think, you know, second to none. Um, and not a terrible culture, but certainly um, one that could use some improvement when it comes to respecting dissenting opinions. Thank you. Thank you. We do have some questions for you. Deputy Mayor Men and Wong. Yes, so can you put the motion up on the screen before you start my time? So you are, so the current process is that this goes to the Civic Appointments Committee, correct? Um, yes. Okay, so uh, we, our peers, we, in the Civic Appointments process, people apply, um, the, the staff do the qualified, very qualified, qualified, and unqualified, yes? I, I believe so, yes. Well, well, I'm disappointed that he doesn't know yet, he's putting well, his motion. I, no, do respect, yes. cha you're changing the process. Question, question. You're changing the process, are you? Question. Councillor you, Perks, I, please. Sorry, Councillor Perks. I'm asking, Perks. Madam Chair, I'm, I'm asking a question. I'm between guys, I can't help it. But well, then he has, a, Perks, he has a choice, he can get don't it don't interrupt. Um, Madam Chair, are you familiar with the process? Yes, I am. Okay, very good. So, assuming that you know the process. So, why are you changing the existing process? So, we sometimes, this is a process that we have started using this term as well for a number of bodies. So it still goes to um, the, um, the, the, the same committee. The only difference is the initial screening is done by city staff who then bring names um, to the appointments committee. So, so and, and we've done that on a number, with a number of other bodies um, this term. That's a change. Um, and um, I, given what has happened um, with the parking authority and the amount of um, overhaul that needs to be done to policies and procedures, I think this body merits um, having um, an additional step put into the selection process so that we're sure we don't repeat history. So why this? Why this particular body, this particular agency, and not any other agency? Not, well, not let's say Waterfront Toronto, why not the Toronto Hydro Board? Why are you picking this particular agency? Councillor, what did, distinguished you read, did you read the report from Tories? I, I, I don't know why you would ask that if you read it, why this agency? I'm asking, Madam Chair, I'm asking him the question. I'd like the answer, please. Because we have a well-documented list of all the problems with this body um, and what it would, is required to fix it, and that um, requires uh, a, um, you know, a, I think that requires a different selection process. And as I said, I did discuss this with the city manager who um, was in agreement. So, he, well, f fair enough. So, um, so you don't believe so actually, so I actually want to ask a question with regard to this process. Will all the resumes of all the applicants still come to this committee, and do we have to accept all the people that are recommended through this, your proposed interview process? Well, my understanding of the process is yes and no to those questions. Can you please tell me which part is yes and which part is no? Um, yes, it all has to come to the committee, and no, you don't have to accept what's presented to you. So, so, all, so your, in your motion will contemplate all the resumes still coming with the, the same division between very qualified, uh, qualified, and not qualified. I, I don't know about the very qualified, not qualified. The, uh, as a list of my understanding is, this could be a question of the well, city the, uh, clerk. That was your last question, Count. Uh, I don't know what you should be more appropriately asked of the city clerk, but my understanding is that you get a list of recommended people with all of their resumes and any other information the committee wants. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Carroll. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I might be able to 
help through questioning. I'm wondering if Councillor Fillion is uh, proposing this change because of the, the report's recommendations. Isn't it so that Justice Yakabuchi's report actually highly commends what was our old process? At the time he was doing this governance review, very similar to the process you recommend, that was the process, and he commends that process and then goes on to remind board members what their duties will then be. So your motion is simply trying to keep the TPA using the selection Justice Yakabuchi comments on, compliments, and highly commends. I'm, I'm not is that sure not the case? I'm not sure that's correct, Councillor, but... Um, it's very uh, similar. Your motion is very similar to the, to the process outlined on page 28 of the report. The problem is we then changed our process after this report was written. I, I, I don't think that's the case. I think probably any questions of clarification about this process might be best directed to the city clerk. Okay, and I did ask if there were any questions to staff. Nobody had any questions. Councillor Holliday. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I just want to understand the motion if it's the councillor's intent that is it five board members that would be appointed is the recommendation from the city clerk and the city manager to be one for one so if it's five members that are being selected for the board is the intention to have uh, a final five go to the civic appointments committee or a tranche of qualified candidates go to the civic appointments committee um i i'm wondering madam speaker if we could ask if we could al allow questions of the clerk because I think that's who can answer those kinds of questions. I, I can't answer that kind of detail. This is a process we're currently using. I think the staff can but, explain exactly how yeah, it but works or would work. Councillor well, Fillion, I specifically asked three times, do we have questions of staff? Was Nobody had my, any questions. Was before my motion, Madam Chair, I yeah. think we can save so, time. So, um, Councillor Holliday, do you uh, do you have any further questions I, to, I do. Can I see to the, the councillor and then we'll have to discuss if we're going to open it up for questions. May, may I see the motion, okay. please? I just, okay, so, can you put the motion on the screen? There it is. So the, the, it says the city manager staff to shortlist, interview, and recommend candidates to the Civic Appointments Committee. How many candidates will they recommend to the Civic Appointments Committee? I think you need to ask the city clerk that. I, I it is a numerical I believe answer. it's as many people as there are openings, but you know, um, this is a procedure we're currently using. Um, I think the it's best if the clerk um, answers those that kind of detail about how how it uh, works because it is a new process we're using, I believe. So if we're going to open back up the questions, well, I mean, we'll have to take a we'll have to take a vote on that, but it's. Okay. Yeah. Do you have any? It's, it's okay. nothing revolutionary, Councillor. We are currently using this process. I, I just, Madam Speaker, I just need to be clear on it. If it's uh, if it's the the recommendation is a whole pile of people, the Civic Appointments Committee, or if it's just a final. Okay. Group. So Councillor Fillin has indicated to, for, to the answer to that question will have to go to the clerk because he does not have the answer to that. So my question to, oh, um, thank you. Councillor Fletcher, I was just going, do you have a question to cut? Because what, okay. Okay. As far as I understand, there is a short listing and a recommendation, but in my, uh, I, which committees or are, is the clerk interviewing for ahead of time? For Toronto Parking Authority, this motion only refers to Toronto oh, Parking Authority. We. I, I am quite sure that it's the same process we use for a number of other bodies, and the, I'm sure the city clerk could um, identify which ones those are. Where there's an interview process by the clerk. Which ones are those? Committee of Adjustment. Oh, okay, I'm adjustment think, I really think yeah. it's... Okay, okay thank, of adjustment. Th thank you. Um, so just so members of council clarify where what we're doing we're on ex 1.2 Toronto Parking Authority governance 
So we did, I did ask question, I did ask the question if members of council had questions to staff and there were, we didn't have any. So my question to the members of council is, would you like to move motion that we open it and allow the staff, allow the council to ask staff questions? So do we want, do, do, do okay, well let's, let's have a recorded vote to allow members of council to ask staff questions. Okay, because all the questions that are being asked to Councilor Fillion um, are related to staff. So, if, you know, so let's have a recorded vote. Because as you know, once we close that off, then you can't. The motion carries 16 to 6. Okay, so now if members of council have questions of staff, please put their name up under request to question staff and we'll proceed with that. Councillor Carroll, questions of staff. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Have we in, in the most recent uh, governance change, who is answering those questions? Oh, okay. Have we made any changes to how we appoint uh, uh, how we do the appointment process for such things as Toronto Hydro and Toronto Parking Authority? Uh, Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, at uh, the December meeting of Council, Council yes. approved a uh, so-called mixed approach to public appointments for the coming term. This was part of the report on recalibrating uh, your time as members of Council. Yes. And finding the right balance of, uh, you know, when members were sitting in interviews and sitting in committee meetings. And so the four, there were four buckets, if you will, in that mixed approach. The first uh, was um, through to bring uh, appointments through the Civic Appointments Committee in the tr traditional way, and there was a list of agencies approved. Sorry, Madam Speaker, I'm, I'm having a little trouble. I'm getting some background noise. I'm having trouble hearing. I don't know if it's because of the. I don't see anybody behind you talking. Uh, okay, go ahead. Well, it's it's stopped yeah. now, so that's okay. wonderful. Thank you. Uh, the second bucket was the. Uh, Mayor's Corporation's uh, nominating panel, which handles the nominations for corporations, and a list was approved by council there. The third bucket was the, uh, a, a, the establishment of a tribunal's nominating panel to be composed of citizens to make recommendations directly to council on the appointment of members to uh, about seven or eight uh, different tribunals. And then the last bucket, the fourth bucket, was the so-called staff-led process, and there was a list of of uh, boards and agencies uh, established for which the clerk will bring forward a, a slate uh, of candidates for um, nomination by the Civic Appointments Committee to Council. And so that the work of interviewing and screening uh, was right. to be so, uh, given to staff. I'm sorry to rush you, but I, I think I'm going to get cut off. That was a very long answer, but I, I really want to zero in on the change to such things as parking authority and Toronto Hydro, big fiduciary responsibility boards. Um, what's the what's the nuance change there? Well, in the what was adopted in December was. Uh, the Hydro, of course, is a corporation. It would go to the Mayor's Corporation's nominating panel, and Council's decision in December was to assign the parking authority to the Civic Appointments Committee uh, yes. bucket. Yes. Uh, formerly, though, it, uh, I don't know if it was an informal part of the process or, or it was policy part of the process, the city manager did uh, uh, actually consult and help in, in the selection of board members to make sure that you had a skills-based board in, in some of those. Is that not the case? Well, since 2014, uh, there's been a public appointment secretary which does that work. It right. uh, brings, uh, right. it identifies and sources candidates and brings them forward to the various nominating panels. 
Right, and since 2014, we've had problems here that uh, that actually uh, uh, led us to this point where we needed to do a governance review of an organization that has a lot of financial responsibility. Um, uh, have we reviewed the efficacy of those changes we made in 2014 to the point where council really had a chance to look at whether or not there were impacts, such as what happened at TPA? Have we, have we, as a council, decided whether or not it was wise to make those changes we made in 2014? Well, the changes in 2014 I referred to are administrative, so I certainly would stand by them, Madam Speaker, since uh, they're, uh, you know, those duties are carried out by the clerk's office. I, I can't really comment on, um, you know, sort of uh, council's decisions. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Councillor Fillion, questions to staff. Thank you. So just again to clarify, this fourth bucket as you uh, referred to it is a staff-led process with recommendations to civic appointments. Um, what other bodies are we currently using this approach with? Okay. We're going to try to um, put that on the screen. trying to find a, something to put on the screen to help us understand how it works. Madam Speaker, the uh, framework for the mixed approach to public appointments is now displayed on the screen. And, uh, it's on the screen. We're in the fourth column, right? Yeah. And the, uh, the staff-led uh, nominations or screening, I should say, uh, for recommendation to, to civic appointments committee is in the fourth column, uh, fifth column. <coughs> Boards, Civic Theatres, Greater Airport Authority, Lakeshore Arena, Pension Plan. So ah. there's a large number of bodies that we're currently doing this with. This is nothing wild and revolutionary and that I dreamt up. I, uh, sorry to ask it that way. So we're using, <laughs> we're using this with uh, a number of other bodies. This is uh, with a process that Council adopted in December. Yes, Madam Speaker, that's correct. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Minnewong. Um Thank you. Um, so let me, so I just, I just want to understand this process. So in this process, staff are going to in, select uh, candidates, they're going to interview them and recommend them to the Civic Appointments Committee. Madam Speaker, that is correct. But we'll also have, so we'll have one, we'll have one binder with the, rec, the staff recommendations who the staff will endorse and then we'll have another binder with all the resumes that say highly qualified, qualified and not qualified. Is that correct? Uh, if, if the committee uh, wishes that information, then yes, that would be provided to the committee. It wasn't going to be as a, uh, in a first instance, but if that's uh, the committee's wish, then that's the practice we'll adopt. Oh, so, so, so in, in the existing arrangement, there wouldn't be any other resumes. There would just be staff's recommendation. Well, Madam Speaker, the, the intent behind the recommendation and the framework adopted in December was to uh, try to relieve um, uh, members from having to sit in interviews and have to do that screening process given the large number of interviews and large number of appointments are made by council. So um, again, there's a map where we have no, no problem providing that information, of course, to support the, the recommendations that uh, the staff are going to uh, make to the committee. So as, so as the chair of the committee, I actually really want to thank you for doing that. Um, but so if we wanted to do additional interviews, we would have to, the committee would have to uh, 
um, direct staff to bring the, all the other resumes forward? Yes, Madam Speaker. Obviously, if the committee is unhappy with the slate that's prepared by staff and put before the committee, it has uh, all, you know, all the procedural options available to it to uh, arrive at the recommendations that it wants to make to Council. How does how does sta how did staff decide and how do you create a decision making framework for deciding which committees should go through this process and which ones like let's say we just went through a, a day long interviewing process with the Board of Health and Library Board why not the why not the Library Board why not uh, the Board of Health Good question. well um, Madam Speaker I think the 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 boards that were on the on the uh, in the fourth bucket were the ones the staff viewed as being uh, tending more towards administration or more towards uh, kind of a, a, a routine business such as the pension boards and so forth as opposed to uh, as opposed to some of the boards that are on the other lists sorry the other list so if it's just it's more administrative um, you put it in the in the fourth bucket and then but the one what would what would the board what would you consider the Board of Health being, if it's not more admin, or the Library Board, which, or let's say, or, um, I don't know, Waterfront Toronto, or what would you say those are more as not being administrative? What are they then? Old. <laughs> Um, Madam Speaker, I'm reminded of the wording in the report that was before Council, you know, which offered the reasoning that the uh, uh, Council member's time was allocated to screening and interviewing the most high-profile local boards, requiring uh, what we consider to be the highest degree of political oversight. Is there any more high-profile board right now than the Toronto Parking Authority? Yes. Uh, Madam Speaker, I don't have an opinion on that. <laughs> All right, I'll accept that answer. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Holliday. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. So I just uh, wanted to be clear. The question I was getting at and the questions to the member through you to the clerk, um, the effect of Councillor Fillion's motion would, would be that clerks would have to forward five individuals. So they would be the final five recommended appointments to the board. So it wouldn't be a, uh, a tranche of qualified candidates, it would be the final ones. Am I correct in that assumption? Madam Speaker, we haven't, you know, we haven't actually operationalized this new fourth bucket that was created by Council in December, but I would say our intent was to present a slate okay, of and then, five candidates, and it would be up to committee to decide whether it wished to nominate those people or have further review. It, it, we use the term fourth bucket, but it's, it's a fourth process, and it was articulated in the uh, report that had been accepted by Council in December. Is the effect of uh, the member's motion to essentially put the Toronto Parking Authority into that fourth bucket? Uh, Madam Speaker, that is my interpretation of the effect of the member's motion, yes. It would be okay. to transfer it to that fourth process. And would I be correct in inter interpreting the intent of the design of that fourth bucket was that it would be basically a rubber stamp, for lack of a better term, at the Civic Appointments Committee because clerks would take on all the work to do the uh, filtering and uh, qualifying the candidates. They come up with a final group. It would go through Civic Appointments and to Council for final approval. <clears throat> Or would you say that there's any in, there's any process at Civic Appointments Committee to add or remove candidates by intent? Uh, Madam Speaker, the, in, the intent of that fourth process was, again, to save members time from having to interview uh, and screen candidates. All of the, but all of the available resources and information would be available to committee in deciding whether it wished to amend or reject or uh, otherwise uh, change the recommendations of staff. But the design, of, but I think I've got it right to play back what you said. Uh, the design of the process was to finalize as best as staff can the, the final group uh, to in order, in order to have a very efficient committee process. And the intent isn't, isn't to create a scenario each time where you take, add, and remove people. 
But that was the design of the process. That's why it's a fourth bucket, as opposed to what we heard in earlier questions. Uh, boards that are more politically sensitive or have more political files have a different process in one of the other bu buckets. Am I correct in the interpretation? Madam Speaker, that's generally correct, yes. Okay. Um, we set up a special committee also as part of that report in the first council meeting, the Special Committee on Governance. Um, could you remind the council what the mandate of that committee was? Uh, the mandate of the special committee is to look at, is to continue to examine the impact of the reduction in the size of council on the city's governance system. And so the governance system includes the public appointment uh, process that was designed in that report. Uh, I would say yes, the way that you, the council chooses to uh, assign its uh, duties to agencies and boards and the rules that govern them, that's part of governance, yes. So the design of the committee presumably over the course of the year is to explore and understand uh, this new process that's laid out to, in front of us knowing that it's new. Uh, and, but we've got a motion here on the floor that is to begin to change that process right at the outset. Am I correct in the interpretation of those two facts, or those two scenarios, those two things that are going on? Um, I'm not really sure how to answer that, Madam Speaker, other than to say that I interpret this motion as moving one agency from one bucket to another bucket. Uh, could, I, could, a, could a member uh, that has a concern with governance or process, and in particular the new process laid out in the report, uh, be expected to come to the Special Committee on Governance and uh, approach that forum as a place to discuss changes which were brought about in that first report uh, to Council? Uh, Madam Speaker, I'm, I'm not really quite sure how to answer that question. Um, could the Special Committee on Governance be an appropriate forum to raise governance issues such as where an agency uh, or how an agency appoints its board members? Given that the substance of the report that was discussed in, in December, the new governance of this council, dealt with those matters. Uh, Madam Speaker, if the member's asking if uh, the Special Committee on Governance could look at the pu public appointments process, uh, I would say yes, that's, that's Great. Thank you very consistent much. with the mandate. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Crawford. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I just want to, again, just reiterate uh, again, um, part of this four-pronged approach that uh, we agreed to in December. And you're looking at the civic appointments. You recommended a number of different agencies come directly to the civic appointments, Board of Health, Library, and Toronto Parking Authority. So you can just reiterate why you recommended that the Toronto Parking Authority come through these directly to the civic appointments uh, process as part of another, um, I guess, area. I'm just curious, re just reiterate why, why you made that recommendation to us. Uh, well, Madam Speaker, I think we looked at the uh, sort of the major boards of the city and the boards that carry out um, uh, large enterprises and group those together in, in the first category. Okay, so the, and, and the, uh, the councillor who's making the recommendation today is to change that to put it into, as, as we've already um, heard, into another category, which is, uh, again, I'm part of trying to understand why the Toronto Park and Authority and not Board of uh, Health and the Library, and I understand there was a report written, but when we're looking at the potential of, um, you know, a, a governance change and whether or not this is, has to be looked at in a bigger context as opposed to looking at the one-off moving it over. So would you think that this would be more of a, a governance change that may have to be looked at a little bit further or can you give a comment on that? Well, Madam Speaker, it's really in Council's hands how, which boards it wishes to assign to which of these four <coughs> processes. So, um, you know, advice was given in December with, in our original report with the with a chart, and that was our advice at the time, and Council's free to, to make a change to that uh, today if it wishes, or it can confirm what it's already decided. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that's it for questions. Uh, we'll go back to speakers. Um, Councillor Matlow. Madam Speaker, I really just want to uh, use this opportunity to uh, thank uh, Councillor John Fillion. Um, we would not be here if it wasn't for Councillor John Fillion. And uh, every step of the way, Councillor Fillion has uh, been treated by some 
as though he shouldn't be raising these questions. He had the courage of conviction to ring alarm bells when he see wrong being done. And when I say courage, under the threat of being abused by many who didn't want him to ring those alarm bells. But he did it. And why did he do it? Because he knew that he was right. He suspected that he was right, but then he was proven to be correct at the end of the day. No one has been more focused on ensuring that our governance runs not only properly, but ethically. No one more than Councillor John Philly. So I really just wanted to take this opportunity to thank him on behalf of the residents in my community and I'm sure across the city, because we would have not seen the actions taken that led to essentially putting the, authority, the parking authority under supervision due to the nonsense that was occurring there. That there are so many suspicions now of really what the behavior that had occurred for so long before Councillor Fillion identified the problem and we would not be on the road to a far better governance structure along with Councillor Fillion's advice today if John Fillion hadn't done what he did. So thank you, John, for some incredibly important work. Deputy Mayor Menon-Wong. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I am uh, not going to support Councillor Fillion's motion. I'll support the report. Um, and uh, I'll give you reasons why. I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed that the councillor didn't bring this motion to executive committee when it, there, were, there was a, no discussion. We could have had a very, the city manager was there for the entire meeting and we could have actually drilled down fairly deeply to this on this particular issue. Um, also, uh, I'm a little bit, tr I, I actually as chair of the civic appointment committee stand, stand to um, benefit personally as one of the members as will all the other members we won't have to go through the, um, the, the very time-consuming task of go reading all the resumes, uh, coming to a meeting and picking up the interviews, and putting aside, uh, you know, if, uh, what is it, five, is it, how many appointments do we do? Five, five appointees, that's 20 interviews. That's like, a, you know, we're kind of going through a whole day. So it, I have every reason from a personal standpoint, and I think the committee members, you know, not to have to go through that, and it would be easy peasy just to say, here, vote for these. This is what the city staff recommend. Um, it's up to, I mean, I think it's up to council whether, whether uh, they want to go through this process where we abdicate more responsibility to the staff to tell us who should be on that board. We already have within that organization a management that's supposed to represent the city. So the question is, is do you want to have or take away the capacity to put others, other citizen members on the board and participate in the process along with councillors. So there's also a responsibility, I think underlying this is that we have to do this because um, we, we, we need representation there. There will be council representation and I can tell you that all committees have to, you know, you don't just have a fiduciary duty just on the Toronto Parking Authority. It has to be exercised on all committees. More, and I'll tell you, more important ones than, than, than this. I think the real th thing that we have to move, move on forward with the Toronto Parking Authority is the idea of cleaning it up and, the, and making sure that those problems don't have, don't have to happen again. It's not the first time this has happened, the one that, I'll rem that I remember, that, and I've been around long enough that I'm probably one of, the, one, of the, one of the guys, one of the only people that remember this, is the Harbour Commission. The Harbour Commission was a horrible organization. It had similar problems and they changed the organization but they, they didn't you know they, they still had you know citizen board members so I am not voting for it for this particular um, uh, uh, particular motion I'm voting for still having to go through all those resumes and picking out the candidates who we go out and canvas uh, to, to, uh, to get involved in the process and uh, you know, I, I think that's uh, I think that's the proper way to go. Thank you, Councillor Holiday, to speak. Um, so this discussion is all about governance, and there's a lot of components to governance. And uh, I believe that we owe this council a very orderly way to try to manage governance. Now, I, I mean, I'll commend Councillor Fillion for bringing forward an idea. 
Um, my concern is I'm just not sure that this is the right time. Um, it may be an idea worth exploring much further. Um, one of the things that was set up in the report uh, in December was an ability to explore the changes to the City Council's governance. And that's exactly what this is. That is, uh, uh, this motion here is a change to something that was set up in December. Um, we're not even really sure because it's only still January whether or not the new model that was proposed through this report is working. Um, there's some members that are on the Special Committee of Governance. Um, they know that they've been polled for dates for the upcoming meetings. Uh, they should have some holds in their calendars and I expect that there will be one very, very shortly. Um, and so I think I'm not able to support this motion today and it's just because I think there needs to be an orderly way to make changes to the structure that we've got before us. It's going to be a really tough year, I think, for council and for staff and for the public to watch um, the design of the system that we've got here get changed as reports move through here. I think we need just to have an efficient process on this. Um, this is not a motion, again, that I want to support here and now. There might be a better time and place for it. Uh, and, you know, I hope it comes back at a better time and place rather than just on the fly, on the floor, without members really having a chance to understand the implication of changing the public appointments process around such an important committee like the Parking Authority. Thank you. Thank you. If I can ask members of council, it's awfully noisy. If you can please try to keep it down. Um, Councillor Perks to speak. Thank you, Speaker. Um, Members, I urge you to support Councillor Fillion's motion. Uh, in the questions of staff, we heard that there are different models used for different kinds of entities that the city have. Uh, one group of entities, which are the ones that are mostly transactional or just doing routine business, are ones where we felt that having uh, uh, the city staff provide a slate, which still comes to council for us to vote on, by the way, still goes through civic appointments, made more sense. And certain other kinds of boards, the library board, the, TC, the TTC and so on, which do more public policy, is more rightfully something that we as elected officials want to be more engaged in selecting the people. It's a, it's a fair and obvious division. Let's look at what kind of beast the uh, parking authority was. The parking authority principally built parking lots and did real estate deals. It's not, in that sense, a high policy board, but it's one that was vulnerable to political interference. And that, that political interference led to us having to dismiss staff and bring in uh, Justice Iacobucci, who has written a fairly scathing report about some of the behavior of that, that board. And I want to remind you that the council last term actually appointed not someone who was good at real estate deals to be the chair of that board, but rather an ex-politician. And the chair of that board is actually named in Justice Iacobucci's report as not having done his job to the standard that we would expect. Clearly, this is not a public policy board. It's a transactional board, and it's one where, by treating it politically, we created a problem last term. We did our work, and, and thanks to the city manager and this council and Councillor Fillion, we did our work and cleaned up those problems. Now, it's actually going to become even less of an important board because we're, thanks to the efforts of the mayor, moving many of those real estate functions out of the parking authority and into Create TO. So basically, it's going to be administering parking. I don't see why that doesn't fit the definition that uh, the clerk's office gave us a moment ago saying that this is transactional. Now I want to address Councillor Holliday's point that maybe we should send this to the Governance Committee. Recall please that at the, pr the first meeting of Council we were told you have to figure out how to govern in the short term and then we'll set up the Governance Committee to see if we got it right. Councillor Fillion's motion deals with the current appointments. It's not about something we want to do six months from now or two years from now. It's not actually what the Special Committee on Governance was set up to do. We were asked at that meeting to please go, like, 
here's staff's best advice, implement something, and then we'll review it through the Governance Committee. So, Councillor Holliday, as much as I'm looking forward to serving with you on that Special Governance Committee, the task of figuring out what to do with this round of appointments was not our mandate. So I'm afraid I'd have to differ with you on that. Councillor Fillion is making an entirely reasonable way of doing this available to us. It's the same process that we use for selecting the Committee of Adjustment, for goodness sake. And we chose to do that because political interference or the, the sense in the public that there was political interference in the selection of the Committee of Adjustment was bringing government into disrepute. I can't think of anything that happened last term that brought government into more disrepute than what happened on the parking authority. Councillor Fillion is giving us an off opportunity here to solve that problem, to tell Torontonians, no, we're going to have a professional panel give us advice on who would best serve on this board where there has been problems. We still, as council, will have the right to review that and make changes, but if we want to make those changes, we have to do it in full public view, and we will be held, account for, to, to, held to account for that. So I think what Councillor Fillion is proposing is logical. It fits with the, the structure of governance that staff have put forward in front of us, and if we're unhappy with it, we can review it at the, the special committee that Councillor Holliday talked about and make changes somewhere between now and midterm, as the system was designed to work. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Layton to speak. Yes, thank you very much. I'm just rising to say, uh, despite my deepest respect for the chair of the Civic Appointments Committee, and I think he's doing a great job in that role, uh, as a member of that committee, I'm quite happy to take on the, the function of helping uh, nominate these individuals. I think this is an incredibly important body, uh, and it deserves uh, our, our full attention as a committee, so I, I'm happy to dedicate the additional time as a committee member. Thank you. Councillor Crawford. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I will not be uh, supporting the, uh, the motion from Councillor Fillion. Um, I have the opportunity and privilege to be sitting on the civic appointments process for the first time. I'm also on the special governance uh, committee uh, with Councillor Perks and uh, Councillor Holliday. Um, and as Councillor Holliday said, this really is a, a bigger governance issue, and I, I respect the fact that uh, a report has come to us uh, and we haven't act upon this. But I don't think moving the Toronto Parking Authority to another um, area at this point is, is, is proper. Um, is this sort of a, a motion on the fly? Uh, I kind of think it is with regard to the governance because we need to look at bigger issues. I respect the fact that even staff in December brought us their best recommendations on where to look at and how do we change things based on the new uh, 25 member formula. But they did bring recommendations to keep the Toronto Parking Authority with the civic, the civic appointments process. And again, going through that in the last month or so with the uh, Board of Health and, and the library, uh, there's a lot of work involved. In, and as, as Councilman and Juan said, uh, it, it, it could be less work for us, but I think it's an important that this committee has that opportunity to be able to look at everything. And in the event that there sh needs to be a change with regard to parking authority or any other agency to move them, I think that is the work of the, the governance, Special Governance Committee to be looking at in its entirety. And we will be looking at that in its entirety, but to suggest that we, we do this at Council right now, and yes, Council, if you, we had an opportunity to ask the proper questions and look at this a little bit more deeply, even at Executive, where we could have a bigger conversation. We haven't really had, even though we had the opportunity to ask staff questions today, I don't think we've had that opportunity to really look at the, the role of how we look at where different agencies go when we're making decisions on who sits on the board. So I won't be supporting Councillor uh, Fillion's motion. I'm not saying that I, I don't understand and, and would not support that in the future, but I don't think it's the time right now to be able to support that, and at some point maybe in the future I will. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Councillor Lai. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, most of the uh, points that have been made by me, my uh, committee member, I sit on the civic committee mem uh, this year, this term, and I, I have no uh, background information, and thanks to uh, Councillor Carroll uh, that came to 
us here to give us a little bit of a background of what's going on and all that. And, and I do appreciate uh, Councillor Fillion's uh, point about you know where he's coming from and, and, and all the rest of things. And I think we have a new council this time, and I, I am committed, like uh, the rest of my civic appointment committee members, to make sure that we we you know we give the uh, the best uh, consideration and have. Uh, I think we do have a different aspect of expertise in in this, and I think uh, going forward, I I. I I don't think I, I could support uh, the motion for uh, that was being raised by uh, Councillor Fillion. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Carroll to speak. Madam Speaker, the tenor of the debate uh, seems to have morphed into whether or not we think civic appointments is doing a good job. And that's not really what the governance report on the Toronto Parking Authority is about. It is about what happened last term, and I'm going to use some of my five minutes just to read one passage. May and July board meetings. The purchase of 1,111 Arrow Road was discussed at the board meeting on May 26 and July 28. Reports were delivered to the board by staff on both of those dates. Staff reports still did not include a business case, formal or otherwise, in relation to current or future parking needs in the area, which was their only, one and only job, nor did they outline the cost, the revenue, or the ROI of, of operating a parking facility at 1011 Arrow Road. At neither meeting did management explain the basis for determining $12 million purchase price uh, as a fair market value for purchasing the property. Madam Speaker, it's all in here publicly. A lot of the discussion happened in camera at the time, but the governance review now makes public the reason why we actually had to take a board that had been appointed into administrative control, not for the first time. We did it before with uh, one of our theater boards. And we were very careful in going back to having an independent board, went through an evolution, and we now have TO Live, which we expect to be a very successful board. This is a board that has just gone through a very difficult period of time in which the reputations of council board members were, were jeopardized, staff's career were jeopardized, and council itself, not realizing that due diligence hadn't been done, approved a $12 million real estate purchase that they actually knew nothing about, but assumed that the board and the staff of the TPA knew something about, and as Justice Yakabuchi points out, they knew nothing. And so now we have to make sure that as we strike this new board, that there is no political patronage, there is no meddling, that we are setting up a board in the most accountable way possible. And all Councillor Fillion is saying is that in that evolution back to a highly accountable board, why not let why not let us proceed with a practice that lets city clerks and the city manager make sure that that is the case? in this very first new restriking of the board and, and put behind us what happened in the last term. I don't see any reason to vote against that unless you have some problem with guaranteeing accountability and a total lack of political patronage. Those are my comments, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Do we have any further speakers? Okay, last speaker, Mayor Tory. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I, um, first of all, would say, uh, having read through uh, the uh, report that came from Justice Yakabuchi and other colleagues at Tories, that this, uh, and I hope everybody has read it, because it should be required reading, especially for elected politicians. I had the great privilege of being able to serve as a director, in, in, admittedly, in private businesses, but also many charities, and came to understand well, and you learned it in law school, what the role of a director is and what the role of a director isn't. Uh, and and it, it's one of those things where I think it's difficult for us because we're held to account for all kinds of things uh, that, um, you know, that, that have to do oftentimes with the operation of the things that we're uh, overseeing, but in fact our job is, uh, is really oversight and policy setting, uh, as has been mentioned. I just think this report so well sets out uh, for anybody who, uh, like all of us, end up serving in these different kinds of oversight positions, what the responsibility is and how it might, might, might best be carried out. It reminds us of what the role of a director is and what it isn't. And oftentimes we're called upon to be those directors and it's a different kind of role than we have here in this chamber. Uh, I, I will say, having read that report, because people are presenting it in, 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 in different ways, uh, it, 
you know, I, I don't think the objective was to find blame as much as to learn from it, but there certainly was lots of uh, criticism about just about everybody involved in the report, and some of it was stronger than others. But there was nobody. There was no person, there was no body, there was no group of people who came off scot-free on the thing, and I think a careful reading would, uh, would indicate that. Um, I am not going to support this motion. Simply, uh, nothing to do with the, the individual agency we're dealing with here, but as a matter of process. We just approved, and this is part of the huge failing, I think, of government and why government doesn't run well and why we sort of end up getting ourselves in trouble. We just approved, as a council, a new regime, if I can call it that, that deals with uh, how we make these appointments and categorized agencies in different ways. And I'm quite prepared to accept, Madam Speaker, that things change and that you can re-examine that. But the interesting thing in this case was we just approved it in December, I think it was December, of last year. There was a deliberate decision made as to how, on staff recommendations, as to how different agencies and bodies would be categorized within that new regime. And I just think when you're going to change something, you do it thoughtfully. And I said this yesterday in another context. I think if we want this council, you know, for all the commentary that was made elsewhere up the street about how this council could function better, um, you know, and I think a lot of that commentary was probably, um, you know, not, not necessarily well considered, shall we say. <clears throat> the one thing we do that I think stands in the way of us really operating in a business-like fashion is make these kinds of changes on the fly. And in this instance, I can honestly say there was an opportunity last week to come in front of the Executive Committee, to put a proposal forward there that could be subject to a lot of proper questioning, to have uh, competing proposals, if someone had wanted to do so, put forward there so that it could be considered by the Executive Committee and then the result of all that could come here. But I think the worst kind of results we get here is when things are dropped on the table at the last minute, nobody has been, dis been discussed with anybody, and then we all sit around and decide we're going to instantly inform ourselves in time five minutes later to make a decision on something that actually is quite important, how you appoint the directors of what isn't just an important agency of public trust and so on, as Councillor uh, uh, Perks mentioned. It's also a $200 million business. And, you know, I know I look at things in that manner because that's a bit of my training. But this pays us a dividend of millions of dollars. Um, it does involve all the sensitivities that were discussed about real estate and about the impact on the community and small business and so forth and so on. But it is also a close to $200 million business, which to me is a big business and one that you want to see run properly and overseen properly by its board of directors. And so I will just say... For myself, I am very willing to consider a thoughtful, by thoughtful I mean, I'm not saying the Council of has not been thoughtful, but a thoughtfully uh, uh, conceived proposal that may well say we should take a look at a couple of other places that fit within the same sort of category, but we just shouldn't be doing these things on the fly where people show up here and put something down on the table and say, now it's time to vote. It's the wrong way to do it when it comes to these kinds of important decisions. Justice Iacobucci, if he was here, I don't want to put words in his mouth, he would agree with me that that's the first part of good governance is when you make decisions about how your boards are appointed or you know, who does it or who they are, you do that with as much thought as actually the act of doing the appointments and as the act of actually being on the board. And so I will vote against this for that reason, but I'm perfectly open uh, to having a discussion that follows the proper process and isn't something that just has something show up here uh, at 10 o'clock in the morning for us to vote on. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Okay. We're going to um, vote, if you can ring the bells. Put the, uh, the amendments on the screen. Okay, recorded vote. Councillor Karagiannis, Councillor Bradford, please. The amendment does not carry. The vote is 8 to 17. Thank you. On the item, do we want a recorded vote on the item? Recorded vote.
Yeah. Councillor Layton, please. Councillor Ainsley. Deputy Mayor and Wong, Councillor Cole, and Councillor Robinson, please. The item is adopted 24 to 1. Thank you. Our next item is on page 2, EX 1.7. Councillor Bailao, you held the item down. Do we have questions to staff? Questions to staff? No questions? Councillor Bailao? I have a motion. Um, you know, just yesterday we had Bell Let's Talk Day, um, and mental health is uh, an issue that fortunately is getting more attention. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think is getting uh, the help that we all need, and uh, people still struggle to get the help that, uh, that they actually sometimes need financially. And is it coming? Yeah. And um, for anybody that has dealt with this issue, $300 of benefits a year, um, I think, uh, it uh, uh, leaves a lot to wish for. If you really need to reach out for, to, for help, I don't think is enough. I think it's a great proposal we have here in front of us to uh, uh, help our first responders, but I think we need a review because if we're really serious about uh, mental health, if we're really serious about uh, giving the opportunity and, and, and having people to, uh, to seek the help that they wish and they feel, I think as, a, as an employer, uh, we should uh, look into this matter and give uh, our employees uh, the assistance that they need through a good benefit plan. I'm not a benefit expert, so I'm not making a decision here, but I think it is an opportunity that we should be looking at uh, and provide our employees with the assistance that they need. Uh, we do have a question for you. Oh, here we go. Councillor Holliday. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I read supports in the motion, but the, the councillor spoke about changes to the benefit plan, and I just wanted to be clear if this was about changes to benefits or just the general provision of supports to employees. So I don't know. Uh, I think that I don't pretend to know everything that we have available for our employers. I know that uh, for our employees, I know that right now the benefit plans that we have for the employees, as the report says, is $300 a year. And uh, I, do I do know enough to know that $300 a year by somebody that probably uh, is looking to have uh, uh, assistance in this area, it, uh, it, it leaves a lot to wish for. You can't go far, you don't do much. So I don't know what the solution would be. I don't pretend to know. I'm asking staff to talk, to, to look into this. I think, you know, we all have, you know, I, I think most of us have tweeted about it yesterday. We talk about these things. I think as an employer, we have the, uh, the obligation to look into these issues and provide the tools that people need to, uh, to deal with this issue. Okay, so just to be very clear, the intent is not necessarily to open up a discussion on direct benefits. But it might be. I have to be honest with you. It, that might be the, okay. the, the, the outcome of this. It might be that we need to increase benefits to our employees. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Yep. Um, thank you. Deputy Mayor Men Wong to speak. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I'm not necessarily opposed to the intent of Councillor Bylaw's motion, but I do know that um, whenever we increase the benefits, there's a cost to the city. Um, and I know that we can't provide all the benefits we'd like in pretty much every category. Uh, and, and we've been tightening our belts, and things like benefits cost a lot of money and they create, a, they, they create a budget pressure. I think that's one of the things I think through his questioning, Councillor Holliday was alluding to. So I have a concern in that regard. We can't do everything we have, everything we'd like with what we have. And so I think uh, you know, we, have, we have to carefully consider this uh, as we move forward. And the fundamental, I think the fundamental reality is, is we can't pay for everything that we'd like to pay. 
and uh, this has to be any changes have to be considered through the um, uh, the, uh, the the process that we're going to commence, uh, I believe, sometime next year in our collective bargaining agreements. Thank you. Do we have any further speakers? No. Okay, so we have, yeah. Okay, the motion is on the screen. Recorded vote. Councillor Carroll, please. The motion carries unanimously, 25 in favor. Okay. Um, item is amended. On favor? Carried. Our next item is on page two. Uh, Board of Health, uh, Heat Relief Services. Councillor Matlow held the item down. Do we have questions of staff? Questions to staff. I'm going to repeat it because the last time everybody said no and then they had them. Okay. So, Councillor Matlow, you held the item down? Thank you. Um, Madam Speaker, I have, uh, I have a motion with two items. One is uh, to um, allow for variable dates to the uh, heat by law, uh, and this is respect to the tenants who we all hear from every single year. Uh, to uh, better address the reality of what the temperatures are outside and what is forecasted rather than arbitrary dates necessarily. And the other one is to do a careful and thoughtful examination of uh, the controls that, uh, that are, uh, that are uh, demanded of, uh, of windows and how they're closed to uh, address the fact that a lot of people uh, may not have an air conditioning unit, but they're unable to open their window and they're up uh, at a high floor and they are boiling in you know, 80, 90 degree weather. The issue is this. Um, you may remember uh, back in 2011, I first brought a motion to address this. And um, since then, we have had uh, more meetings with both MOS and, uh, and the Medical Officer of Health than I can even remember. Uh, this has been an annual uh, event, but it's also been throughout the year, several meetings. Uh, I think all of us have had our own experiences within our own wards. I would imagine all of us have had this experience where in the shoulder months, and remember the bylaw is between September 15th and June 1st, but in the shoulder seasons when even though you know, September 15th is the date, it may be incredibly hot in the week or two after that date. And we are all hearing from tenants every single year. Uh, explaining, sometimes there's uh, seniors, uh, sometimes there's people with mobility challenges who are in their, their apartments with nowhere to go uh, from their homes and they are, they are suffering from extreme heat to a level that when it's, uh, you know, 30 degrees Celsius outside, it feels like 40 degrees Celsius inside their places, if not worse. Um, even when there are uh, cooling centers such as they've created an ad hoc party room or whatever uh, to create some space for them, it still doesn't solve the fact that you may have somebody, like I've, I've personally visited so many seniors who they're saying, okay, that might be good for an hour here and there, but I can't sleep, like I can't actually function in my own home, and this has not been addressed. So what we've gone back and forth with staff on over the years is, you know, not really just demanding, but, but pleading with them, let's thoughtfully arrive at some place that we can Madam Speaker, there's a lot of noise going on over there, and if I could just ask my time but to be held. If I can ask, please, there's a lot of noise. There's staff and counselors, everyone's. Please, can you keep it down? Thank you. Um, t 
to, uh, anyway, to, uh, essentially to finally arrive at a solution because it's going to happen again this year. And when I say it's going to happen again this year, all of us are going to be hearing from tenants again this year asking, what have you done? Why haven't you found some way to resolve the extreme heat that we're experiencing in our homes? And this is a health, directly health-related issue because we're hearing from people who are suffering in their homes because of this heat. So what this motion would do, starting this year, this year, wait no longer, is to allow for some reasonable flexibility. It doesn't mean that we are going to be dismissing the bylaw outright as it is. So in other words, um, we still want to send a message to landlords that we expect you to have the heat on when the heat should be on. But it also allows some reasonable flexibility within the bylaw to the, medical, to the, to the general manager of MOS and, uh, and in consultation with uh, the, uh, the medical officer of health and understanding, of course, what Environment Canada is forecasting. When the reality is that we've arrived at September 15th or the other end of the season and the heat outside and especially inside doesn't reflect what the arbitrary date on the bylaw says, that there's some way to just get real and address the reality that they're experiencing now. That doesn't exist today. And what we're hearing from landlords, um, some who are just trying to skirt around because they don't want to spend money on, 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 on their buildings, but others who authentically will say, listen, we've been told by the bylaw that we have to keep the heat on and there's no other way to deal with this. And we need to arrive at some flexibility and fairness to them as well to say, you know what, we're going we're gonna to actually be more realistic about when we're making our demands rather than just say this is the day and this is the way it is. So I hope that you will support this. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, moving forward, I've, I've spoken with the clerk. Uh, if there is public notice that needs to be made on this change of the bylaw, there would have to be a public component to ensure uh, that things are done in, in the appropriate way. Thank you. We do have a question for you. Um, can, I, can I please ask staff? Hello? Everyone on this side, please. There's too much noise. Please. Uh, we do have a question for you, Councillor Pasternak. Uh, yes, that, um, thank you, Madam Speaker. We, we haven't been given any copies of motions all, all morning, and I, maybe you could put it on the screen so I could... Yeah, can we see it on the screen? It's part two. Yeah, so um, this, this whole uh, idea of uh, window, window protection and removing that regulation or that code, would that require a, a retrofitting of of all the buildings or, or would you uh, grandfather existing or how how do you envision that ever happening uh, if your if your concern is related to the expense uh, for the uh, owner of the building uh, this would be most likely negligible I mean what there many years ago uh, I believe and I, I could be I could stand corrected but I believe that um, there was a child who uh, fell out of a, a window from a from a from a, a, a high rise, and the the city's response was to be incredibly restrictive about how windows could be opened, and you know for good reason. Um, what this the intent of this is not to suggest that we should let uh, a window just be you know completely open on the twentieth floor, but. Where there, where there are restrictions on, let's say, where a window uh, could be opened from the top and level up, or for, for example, there should be some ways, in a reasonable way, when you are on, let's say, the 20th or 30th floor, and you are literally boiling in your apartment, to allow for some air in, especially if there isn't any central air conditioning or, or an air conditioning unit. Okay, no, I, and, I understand. And I would want staff to make sure, of course, okay. that it's done in a safe no, way. Fair, but fair it, shouldn't be, it shouldn't be a great expense to, to the owner. Yeah, I, I fully understand the discomfort during heat waves or other times where, where when you cannot open the, the window uh, yeah. for, for a breeze. But isn't this more of an engineering issue where you develop a new generation of windows where they can be uh, open partially uh, uh, to let the breeze in but not risk the, the safety of the residents? It, 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 it's not, it's not I, I would submit to you that it's not that complex in most cases. In some cases, it's just about actually relieving the latch and allowing for that air to get in. Uh, and that'll be a, a building by building basis, but it's also allowing for that, that, that opportunity where safe and where reasonable 
for those windows to be open. Some cases it may be retrofitting. It's not, by the way, this does not prescribe in any way that they must do it today. Uh, this is for staff to come back to us and say what yeah. they think is appropriate. Right. I know yeah. I do recognize this report back. My, my yeah. primary concern was uh, how do you balance safety and comfort? And I think safety is the is the priority around. Oh, I, I agree with you. And and so a uh, this is for staff to give us their professional advice on. B um, safety also. I mean, I would never. I'm a father of a six year old. I would never want to do anything that would ever jeopardize the safety of a child in the building. So if they came back with something that seemed unreasonable, I wouldn't support it either. I, w I would want it to be reasonable so that air can get in, but not some big open window for for any risk. B. Um, safety also is related to uh, the heat. And we have unsafe, unhealthy conditions each shoulder season where we have people like in, if you, if, if you ever visit you know, one of those homes, you, you'll see what I mean. It is, it is at a level that is, you would never want your parents to be in that situation. And okay. that, so that's what I'm trying to mitigate. Thank you. That was your last question. Okay. Um, Councillor. Perks to speak. Thank you, Speaker. I have a motion as well. I move that City Council request the Medical Officer of Health to report to the Board of Health on possible enhancements for signage and neighbor checking in time for consideration of the 2020 budget. Um, let me just explain what that's about. So the report in front of us uh, deals after, oh, I want to say 15 years work at the Board of Health, uh, long since before my tenure, with what do we do in heat emergencies. And if you recall, over the last decade, uh, in the US Midwest and in Central Europe, there were periods when the temperature got above 35 degrees and stayed there for four, four or five days. And in one case, thousands of people died. And in the other case, tens of thousands of people died. We also have had work from our Environment and Energy Division and Public Health saying that those temperature thresholds are going to become the norm all summer long within our lifetimes, certainly within the lifetime of my children. In other words, we are creating conditions where those heat emergencies that will kill thousands of people are going to become the norm every summer in the City of Toronto. Public Health, when reviewing this work, found that over 100,000 people living in the City of Toronto have, uh, are at risk of this happening for a variety of, of reasons. One could be pre-existing risk of heart and respiratory problems. One could be the nature of the units that they live in. Perhaps they live in a, an apartment building that was built before there was such a thing as air conditioning and it's impossible to retrofit them with uh, the, the necessary uh, infrastructure to air condition them. In response, the City of Toronto has started to create cooling centres and a variety of other things. The new report says we should broaden that network of centres, we should maybe engage some other partners than just public buildings in trying to get that, and we should think about extending it over time. What my motion does is say, if we are going to create these new cool places across the City of Toronto, let's promote them by signing them well. It doesn't even say let's do that, it says let's find out what it would cost to do that and have that information available for council to consider next year. Doesn't say we do it, just says what would it cost to promote it better. That's the first part. The second part speaks to something called neighbour checking. One of the strategies that many municipalities across the world who are trying to deal with the changing climate have adopted is to set up networks whereby people who are particularly vulnerable, say they're seniors, say they're low income, say they have a heart condition, say they live in a place without air conditioning, have someone who will check in on them to make sure they're not in a medical crisis, to make sure that they've had a chance to get somewhere where there is air conditioning, to make sure that they're drinking water, to make sure that they're not lying on the floor dying. We've piloted programs like that in Parkdale a number of faith groups in the City of Toronto have worked with our uh, uh, Environment Energy Division to pilot projects in neighbourhoods, uh, including Councillor Pasternak's, I believe. 
but we don't have a robust system for making sure that that, that will happen in a routine way and, and we'll have the network in place so that when we do have that heat emergency, the, the, there will be people who know to check on their neighbors. And we will know who the vulnerable people are that we need to check on. So my, my motion asks, think about what we have to do to make sure that network of people who check on their vulnerable neighbors is robust and ready for the time when we hit a crisis. Not asking to spend any money, I'm asking for staff to tell us what it would take to make those two things, promoting the cool centers and enhancing and making the neighbor checking programs more robust. I hope you will support them. Thank you. Councillor Wong Tam to speak. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I do have a motion if the clerks can put that on the screen. Thank you. Uh, there it is. Um, I would like to amend uh, and propose to amend uh, recommendation number two to include in the work plan of the interim uh, work group um, uh, the creation of a bylaw for property owners to maintain up-to-date contact lists for their tenants, which includes name, telephone number, special health circumstances, to be used in extreme weather emergencies and to consider the feasibility of creating a cool room or air conditioned space and or shade structure uh, on the property itself. Um, Madam Speaker, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, I think it's important that we, we recognize that we are in this new um, time of extreme weather conditions and you know climate change is real. Uh, resilient cities around the world are, are, are thinking uh, and developing strategies on how to keep their citizens and their communities safe. Um, and with the City of Toronto it's no different. Uh, which is why I think it's important that we, we, we spend a little bit of time uh, setting up this particular dialogue uh, so that staff can actually do the work that they need to do. It is going to be very difficult, even if the City of Toronto opens up um, cooling spaces by way of making sure that all our city facilities are open, all 250 of them across the city, and designated as cooling areas around the city uh, in the time of extreme heat. Uh, there's just very little opportunity for everyone to get to all those facilities. And whether it's because they have difficulties traveling or perhaps uh, circumstances beyond their control, they can't get there. The one thing I think we can do is ensure that uh, the property owners, um, if you own a building, uh, if you own a, a triplex, if there's a way to, to think through how do you actually share that responsibility which means that those who are property owners should actually be keeping a list of their contact uh, of, of tenants so that when there is an emergency, how do you contact them? Uh, we've just learned this very, very recently at 260 Wellesley, uh, 1,000 plus people in the dark without heat, without water, um, and there was no real direct way to contact them. We've also learned with the 200 Wellesley fire that there was a suggestion that we create a vulnerable persons list. So this motion is really to ask that interim working group that's already set out in the report that's going to take place. Uh, the Ministry of Health recommends that the interim um, interdivisional working group uh, come up with strategies to focus on programs, uh, enhance communication, and, uh, and, and also further policy initiatives to deliver the outcomes that they're looking for, which is to make sure that people are safe uh, under extreme uh, heat conditions. And, uh, and that's all my motion does, is, is simply just perhaps, uh, and, and the interim working group may actually already have this on their work plan. Uh, I did speak with the, um, uh, the deputy, our, our, uh, our uh, medical officer of health uh, and the policy director, uh, who both uh, helped me with the wording of this motion. So I want to thank them for that. Um, but in, in case it's already on the working group, let's, uh, on their work plan, let's just highlight it that we expect this work to come back and, uh, and we can then uh, proceed on what their recommendation is moving forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. We do have a question for you, Councillor Holliday. I'll, I'll be quick. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker. I wondered uh, through you if I could ask the, uh, the Councillor if it was a friendly amendment to add the word voluntary contact list as I am concerned about compelling landlords and tenants to exchange information, in particular health circumstances. Some tenants may not want to give that type of information. So if somebody was vulnerable and wanted to provide the contact information, that it would be on a voluntary basis. 
Um, so, th th so thank you very much, Councillor. I, I s would see that as a, as a friendly amendment. The only thing I wasn't 100% uh, clear on, to be quite honest, uh, was the Privacy Act. Right. And, and making sure that that information of that person uh, stays with that individual unless they give explicit consent to, to, to grant it. Uh, and then, of course, being uh, who controls and, and, and uses that list to communicate. Uh, I think what we are seeing around, around the world is disaster relief, disaster communication. All of these things are rather topical in trying to balance the issue around privacy, uh, individual uh, consent, as well as the need uh, for first responders to communicate uh, when they need to with those vulnerable uh, individuals is, is, is what I think, uh, the striking that balance. So if the word voluntary goes in there, I, I don't see a, a problem with it. I just want to make sure that we don't necessarily uh, stop the action from taking place. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Speaker. Okay, so Councillor Wong Tam, you accept that uh, amendment? I yes, I do. Thank you. All right, so Councillor uh, Matlow. Yeah, thank okay. you. Uh, just on a, a, a point of Something. order or privilege uh, uh, and helping the meeting uh, be effective. Um, uh, so I've decided in consultation with uh, the chair of the Board of Health, uh, Councillor Cressy, along with the medical officer of health and uh, Whatever we go, Tracy Cook goes by now, the deputy deputy city manager, uh, <laughs> Czar, uh, that uh, that I'm going to withdraw uh, my uh, motion, and that we are going to send it to the February 25th uh, Board of Health meeting, where we can uh, uh, you know actually get this done this year. The reason I moved it at this uh, meeting is to, uh, with no pun intended, light the fire that's necessary to finally get results. And I have commitments from uh, both of our wonderful staff there that they are uh, resolved to achieving that at the February 25th meeting. And I want to thank Councillor Cressy uh, for, for you know, being willing to run with this at that meeting. So thank you. Thank you. So Councillor Matlow is asking to withdraw his motion number one. All in favor? Carried. Councillor Cressy to speak. I, well, thank you, Speaker, and I will keep this very short. Uh, I want to thank our staff uh, in Toronto Public Health for bringing this forward. It, it goes without saying that as it relates to heat relief strategies, this has to be more than the notion of cooling centres. It has to be an integrated city-wide approach utilising both city spaces, uh, the more than 250 <coughs> sites that we have that currently provide space and have cooling, but also non-city land. And I think Councillor Perks has some excellent suggestions related to making that more visible and accessible. Uh, but I do want to pause to take a moment to the issue that Councillor Matlow has raised here, and I wouldn't say just raised today, but raised rather consistently for the past 10 years, 9 years, something like that, which is, as you all know, in the shoulder seasons, where you know, the, the heat has been turned on and it's 30 degrees outside, and it can be stifling. And you've all seen it when you're going door to door, and you've seen it when you're dealing directly with your constituents, and we do not have a solution today. And the solution cannot be on its own go to a cooling location because how do you sleep at night? And so I want to thank Councillor Matlow for remaining as diligent on this as he is and will continue to be. And there is my commitment working with our staff uh, and the Councillor to work towards resolution in this shoulder season. Thank you. Thank you. If we can put the motions on the screen, please. Okay, motion number three first. As uh, you've amended uh, with the friendly amendment. All in favor? Carried. Motion number two by Councillor Perks. All in favor? Carried. Item is amended. All in favor? Carried. Okay, our next item is on page two, i.e. 1.4, Metrolinx, Eglinton, Crosstown, Light Rail Transit. Uh, Deputy Mayor Min and Wong held it down. If we have any questions of staff, if you can please put your name, request to question staff. Deputy Mayor Min and Wong. Well, that seems somewhat obvious. Um, <laughs> first question. And I, I did ask staff this, and I, I, they were going to look at this to see if they could get this information. Um, 
So I'm curious to know the delay times uh, because uh, Eglinton right now is a complete mess. I don't know that it's going to get much better even when they finish the construction. And I've been trying to find this problem out for the last, uh, I got an answer to this question, for the last year and a half. It's a pretty basic question, Madam Speaker, which is what's the delay time before and after? Once you put in the LRT, how much longer is it going to take to get to work? Nah. It's going to be fun. Okay, through you, Madam Speaker. Um, so the Council and I have had a number of discussions around this. Um, the simple answer is that we don't know, Councillor. That work was not completed as an integral part of the uh, transit project assessment process, which was conducted in 2008. The traffic modelling at the time, which looked at the impacts of implementing the LRT, focused on the impacts at individual intersections along the route, using uh, synchro modelling to understand that. It's fair to say that traffic is going to be it's going to take longer, right, to drive? Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's fair to say that the assumption that was made as part of the modelling work at that point in time was that the corridor was operating at capacity for cars yeah. at that point in time and would continue to operate at capacity for cars. What the project was focusing on was about um, opening up the people moving ability of that corridor by implementing the light rail transit project. There's around, at that time when they did the TPAP, there was around 130,000 bus passengers were using that corridor each day and about 30,000 cars. So it's about expanding the ability for people to switch from car traffic to public transit. Do you know how many cars use the road now? Uh, it's about the same. It's around about 35,000 a day, councillor. And with all the, all the massive development that's going along, I'll just talk uh, from, let's say, Leslie all the way to the east, east to the end of the line. How many extra, um, uh, how much more development, how many more units are going on, the, on Eglinton? Uh, through the chair, we're, we're currently reviewing. Through the chair, we're currently reviewing the the uh, development estimates uh, through the Golden Mile uh, project on the on the east side of Vic Park. But certainly, I'd safely say that along the corridor, you're dealing with thousands of new residential units. On the west side, you're dealing with 7,700 7, additional units. That's in the Domino's Crossing. Yes. Uh, I. I take you at your word, Councillor. You may have been at the community meeting last night. I was. Um, so, and that's 7,700 units plus, I, you know, in the Scarborough, in the Scarborough, the Golden Mile study, do you know how many extra, uh, extra units are going to be along there? Again, that's uh, why we're uh, undertaking, through the speaker, undertaking a study to, uh, to put in place a planning framework for those uh, many, many uh, development applications that have been put before the city. Uh, that is why we need to uh, look at moving people on public transit because it will be impossible to move them on uh, through, through cars. Have, have you figured out the, um, for all those new units, so which would probably, you know, if it's 7,700 on my side, it's probably, you know, easily twice that uh, uh, through this um, Golden Mile Secondary Plan. Um, do you know what the modal, s the, the, the split would be between uh, generally between drivers and uh, transit users? I'll put your time on hold. Uh, we're, we're looking at uh, increasing the modal split to 40% on public transit. Uh, I'm so 60% will be, uh, will be starting their cars and trying to get on an already congested Eglinton Avenue. Uh, again, we're, we're looking at shifting travel behavior. Uh, you do that through many, many mechanisms, including providing reliable public transit so that we can increase uh, people who are choosing to move regionally on public transit. Just uh, one f uh, final question. Uh, this arrangement where you don't study before so you, so, you know, you can claim that you don't have the data afterwards to study uh -huh. the delay. Um, are we going to continue to do that? I just think for transparency purposes so people can measure if we're, for example, putting in a new transit line or putting in a bike lane, let's say on Don Mills Road that's already congested, are we going to do, is your office committed to doing before and after analysis so that people know what actually they're getting after the fact? That was your last question. So uh, through, through you, Madam Speaker, um, so 
the, the modelling that was done at the time in 2008 was a function of the transport planning modelling tools which were available at that point in time. Um, along with lots of things, technology has moved on since then, models are far more sophisticated now. So that sort of journey time modelling work is now done as an integral part of, a, of an EA for a, a large transit project, yes. Thank you. Councillor Thompson, questions? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Speaker. Um, I'm just wondering if you had a map um, with respect to the, um, uh, the proposal that you have in the uh, report here about removing and adding new um, turning and traffic uh, signals and so on. Uh, Is there something you can put on the screen? Through the speaker, yes, we do, and um, Navi will head back and, and put it up on the screen. I don't know if you can hold your hold your time. Speaker is absent. <laughs> so. <laughs> it is. It's in the report. It's a yes, map then, in the report. You can, you can cut the oh, all right, Navi, can you? I just wanted to get some. Camera. Can the staff do it from here? Can you? Yeah. Okay. That's great. That's great. Thank you. Put your time on hold. Thank you, Speaker. It was supposed to be at 26 seconds, but it's now at 51. It's okay. So it's lost some seconds. It's all good. Thank you. So, um, would I be correct by saying on my right hand side, would that be the east and the left hand side being the west? Yeah, south the east. orientation of this map is that north, north direction is up. South is south. South is down. down. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So, you are moving um, some, you're, you're removing some uh, turning allowance that's in place now. So, you're, make it, you're, you're creating some restrictions with respect to. I guess that would be in the direction here, more left-hand turns, is that correct? So in some cases where, uh, this is resetting to the permanent condition. And so in some cases uh, we are rescinding prohibitions, like with the, there's a U-turn prohibition where that black dot is that we are now adding so that you can effectively head. And that would be, what, that would be Creighton? That will be created in order to uh, no, enable a south, yes, that will be created, that U-turn. Right now it's not allowed, and we would be creating that as a permanent condition so that vehicles can travel southbound uh, from Eglinton on to Pharmacy. Right. Now this is a project that's uh, Metrolinx and Crosslinx and the city engaged, is that correct? Correct. It's, it's a, a, a Metrolinx project that Crosslinx is delivering on their right. behalf. Right. And, and this piece of it, we are now looking at how we uh, signalize and how we, what we restrict in terms of turning and what we add in order to uh, create, I, I, I guess, a more efficient way of, uh, of ensuring that the transit, the cross down that's going across, will be able to do so more efficiently and that the turning and uh, in, a, in a more safe way for the drivers in the area. So is that, that what this objective is? The, uh, through, through the speaker. So the objective is to make sure that the permanent condition, once the LRT opens, uh, not only allows for safe passage, say allows for safe passage through the area. So in some cases during construction, right. existing prohibitions or existing turning movements had to be prohibited, and those now are going to be reinstated, or in some cases they're going to be removed. So these reports are providing uh, the ability for us to resolve those to this permanent condition. So in right. this case, you will no longer be able to take a, a left, a southbound left turn onto Pharmacy from Eglinton. In order to make that left turn, you're going to have to go north and come back through a U-turn to go back south again. And can you tell me how will Ashenby help? Ashenby, which is north, that will then um, assist with respect to some of the pressure and the ability for, for traffic to flow in the area. I know relating to Councilman and Wong's question. Ashenby should be the one on the north. Just where the block that, or the black uh, dot is, the next street up is Ashton B yeah, on so, the so, east side. Uh, sorry, Councillor. So uh, that currently um, does have a okay, signal. Hold on, hold on. Sorry. There is a lot of noise. Councillor Matlow. We have a smaller council. Councillor Robin, please, it's so noisy. It's louder. There's an existing signal there. Yeah, that's what Okay. 
mostly. Who's making all that noise? It's not me. It's not me and Councilor. Sorry for the interruption. Okay. Ashton B. My understanding is Ashton B. at Pharmacy currently has a signal. No, no, no. I understand that. Okay. It was really about some of the issues around the pressure as it related to Councilman and Wong's questions about vehicle movements and so on. But Ashton B. will actually help to relieve some of the pressure from on Eglinton. Is that correct? Yeah, the, correct. Because it's a parallel corridor. Absolutely. Right. Right. Um, so about queuing, for example, now. At Birchmount, do we have a similar situation there? Are we restricting at Birchmount? We are, yes. Right. And so where would you turn in order to do a U-turn on Birchmount uh, in order to either go, in this particular case, to go south? And I don't really see, it's not really clear to me where Birchmount is. So, so pharmacy. So what I'm actually trying to understand is the turning, and uh, I'm assuming that the very right, is that, is that Birchmount, the very right, or is that Kennedy? That looks like Birchmount. Where do you turn there? So the, the left turn at Birchmount would be restricted. The, right. uh, the next left turn that you would make would be on Borden. On where? Borden. Warden. 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 Oh, on Warden Avenue. So that's going west. So that's further, that is further west, So, yes. in, you know, if you wanted to go south on Birchmount, I'm just looking at my time, how would you do a U-turn on Birchmount as it is now? Are you widening the lanes? That was your last question. Yes. We yeah. Uh, the, the current proposal is that the Birchmount left turn would be restricted, and you would, your next opportunity to make that left turn would either be on, sorry, I can't see this one, on, would be on Warden Avenue. There's a smaller street in between. Okay, thank you. Councillor Perks. Thank you. I, I want to pursue some of the questions Councillor Min and Wong was asking. The, the capacity before we undertook the LRT program on Eglinton and the Eglinton Connects program for automobile and transit was about what? Uh, for you, Madam Speaker, so there were around about 35,000 cars each way all day on Eglinton at the moment. Um, and there was around about 130,000 uh, transit passengers. Okay, and what will it be after uh, the, the Crosstown's operating and the, tr the street design work that you've done here? Um, so I don't have the overall volume numbers, uh, Councillor, um, but what I can say is that at the moment the capacity, the car carrying capacity is a, around about um, 3,500 um, cars an hour. Um, and you'll be aware that the majority of those um, would be single occupancy vehicles. But then uh, when we move to uh, LRT, the carrying capacity of that is, is, is around about 6,000 um, passengers an hour. Why do you give me one is all day and one is hourly? But the point is that there will be an increase in the total capacity through the corridor. So I, I think the key message is there's a significant increase in overall uh, people carrying capacity along order of magnitude on a daily basis uh, probably at least double councillor at least double at least the double. capacity so if right now I was uh, you've said before the capacity of adding the two together call it 170,000 people all day two way if I was the 171st thousandth person that would put the street over capacity and, and travel times would fall or, or travel times would increase because you're over capacity, right? Correct. Correct. Now, if when this opens and we do the traffic amendments that you have and, and have it, the 170,000 and first person who travels will not experience those new, new delays. In fact, we'd need double the number of people to be experiencing the over capacity delays that we would have experienced before this project was put in place. Uh, through you, Madam Speaker, in broad terms, yes, Councillor. So, so when, when Councillor Min and Wong asks you to provide him uh, with, you know, what will the delay time be, an answer would be for about 160,000 people, there's no delay time. In fact, their travel time has improved. You could write the report to say that, couldn't you? That would be correct, Councillor. Perhaps that's what you should tell Denzel Min and Wong next time he asks you that question. Councillor Fletcher. Thank you, 
Speaker, uh, this is uh, Metrolinx, managed through Metrolinx, right? Through you, correct. And then what's the, wh how of, who is the person dedicated to uh, deal with all the traffic issues, be looking at that all the time, checking? Is that a Metrolinx person or is that something they pay for, for us to do? So Crosslinks has a traffic consultant. I believe it's uh, the IBI group is their traffic consultant. They work uh, closely on developing all the plans, doing all the analysis currently, and uh, informing the project. Um, our staff uh, provide the permitting oversight for the construction when it impacts city rights of way. So this is really... So we review the work that Crosslinks delivers. You review the work they deliver. You review the plan. You review requests that they might make, and then you review what they've done. Or yeah, and we review the, the conditions. We work with them to review the conditions on the ground as the construction is moving forward as well, making sure that they're meeting their permit conditions. But is there one person that if there's issues, that there's one person on that team dedicated full-time Traffic problem solving, pick up the phone, they're involved with the city, with you, with the councillors, everybody knows what to do and they know who to go to. One go-to person. Uh, through you, Madam Speaker, yes, there is councillor. Uh, that person is uh, Navi Tafgar. He's the manager of the Transit Projects Unit. And he's only dealing with this huge project. He's, his team are responsible for dealing with all of the Metrolinx transit projects which are taking place within the city. So he's, he would be the primary point of contact. His staff could then answer any questions which you have. I guess it's not really questions. It's somebody that they visit every day. They see what's going on. They're there in the morning. They're there at four. They're making suggestions. They're watching the signal timing. They're doing everything. Who's that? Uh, through you, Madam Speaker, yes, that, are, that is staff that, that come under NAVI. So there's a staff that that's what they do every day and they report back that's correct, councillor, yes. And then how do fixes happen? So then we would initiate fixes through, um, uh, through crosslinks um, by communicating back to them the issues that we're seeing out on the street and asking them to rectify those. Okay, thank you. Oh, you have a dedicated person. Councillor Layton. Just a couple very, very quick and simple questions. These uh, lane closures, the permanent design, uh, were we aware of these prior to today and when this report came forward? Uh, through you, Madam Speaker, uh, yes, Council was aware of those lane closures. They were an integral part of the 2009 Council report, uh, which was considered by Council when they considered the uh, TPAP uh, report, so the environmental assessment and approve that to move forward. It, so I'm, I'd, I'd understand we've known about this since 2009. That's correct, Councillor. And that this was coming, this shouldn't come as a surprise. Is there any other room in the right of way to put the turn lanes? What would happen if we removed a turn lane? Or if we maintained a turn lane? If we maintained a turn lane, then we'd have to um, remove other traffic lanes to accommodate that. So either a through traffic lane or, or the crosstown itself. Correct. Correct. Thank you. No, no. Oh. Uh, just one more question. Is it possible to build this without any construction along Eglinton? <laughs> I'm asking for, on behalf of my colleague, Councillor Cressy. No, Councillor. No traffic impact. It's not, not bad. Thank you. Okay. Um, Councillor Carroll. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Just a, a quick question, anticipating where we might be going in the discussion. It's a planning question. Are there, are, we're, we've, we've heard about you know, how much density is coming. Are there lessons to be learned to make sure that you actually realize that, that mode change that you're looking for? Are there lessons to be learned along the Shepherd Subway Corridor? Uh, through, the, through the speaker, the lessons are to look at it holistically and comprehensively, to uh, evaluate the infrastructure impacts in advance, uh, uh, to understand, and as we are doing along the Eglinton line, putting in place planning frameworks that shift right. the movement of people away from automobiles onto other modes of transit, locally through better but sidewalks. That can, a lot of that can be achieved 
in how you allow those, those dense developments along it, how you direct them to the transit stations. Oh, absolutely. All the, uh, at different scales, whether it's a building scale, a neighborhood scale, a more regional scale, everything to, uh, to uh, move people toward making other travel choices, making it safe, making it comfortable, making it efficient. That's the lesson overall that we're applying across the city, especially in high growth areas. Right. And so at Don Mills and Eglinton, the Golden Mile plan, are we looking at the what to do's and what not to do's along the Shepherd Subway corridor and making sure that the, the successful places where we're seeing huge uh, Monday through Friday uh, transit usage of the Shepherd Subway, are we going to those and using those as examples of, of how we, we uh, uh, arrive at approval of developments along this yes, new line? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Holliday. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I believe my first question is for transportation. So when the, uh, I guess the report came, the EA in 2009, there was some discussion about changes to turns, changes to capacity on Eglinton, and changes in capacity on the intersections of the through streets. And I, I would imagine that council knew that there would be a reduced capacity in this area. Is that correct? Uh, through you, Madam Speaker, in terms of car capacity, yes. Car capacity. I, I'm, I'm zoning in on the cars. Okay. So, 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 so we, we knew, and people knew. Would it be safe to assume that the impacts are, are quite large, right? You've got the Eglinton Corridor, and we're, on this report, we're kind of zoomed in on a very narrow space, but parallel routes and through routes, so the north-south streets, are also affected by, for sure, the construction, but also the permanent changes. Is that correct? Uh, through you, Madam Speaker, to, uh, to some extent, yes, Councillor. So if, there, if the capacity is reduced, it, it causes some congestion. I guess my question is, what are we doing on the outskirts of this area to improve capacity and to reduce congestion, to improve safety, to improve cut through streets and alternative routes that the motor vehicles have eventually shifted to? Because that's all juxtaposed against the notion that we're growing in density around this area and even on the outskirts, so there are more people. So even if we've got a modal shift, there is still more action around this corridor. Through, through you, Madam Speaker, uh, yes, there, there will still be more action around the corridor, as you say, as a result of the growth. Um, based on the uh, EA work, we have the modelling work that was done at that point in time. As with all of these projects, when they're actually implemented, modelling is only a tool to try and gauge what the likely impacts are going to be. Uh, so what we'll be doing is, uh, w when the uh, Crosstown opens, we'll be doing active monitoring of um, movements in the streets around that, and we'll be making any modifications which, which we think are necessary to um, ameliorate any impacts that um, materialize. So how far out do you monitor from Eglinton? Is it 100 meters, a kilometer, two kilometers? And it would be a reasonable assertion that you know, traffic impacts are, can be quite large. Uh, because the impacts are pushed back. It's like a domino effect or like a stone thrown in the water. It puts waves out. So things are different in that part of town, and I'm, I'm sure if I asked the residents around there, they would agree with that. How far out are we looking at the impact of this change? So through you, Madam Speaker, there's no real hard and fast rules in terms of um, the extent of impacts. As you say, the extent of impacts of a major uh, project such as this can be more widespread than you would see in a more localized, smaller project. Um, so we'll just really be keeping it all under active review, listening to 311 complaints, listening to councillor feedback, looking at what's going on out there on the street, and then um, reacting and responding to that to, to mitigate impacts. Okay, and can you tell me what are the mechanisms to react and respond? And uh, let's say uh, a parallel route half a kilometre to the north says, hey, look, you know, the traffic on here is un unbearable. It's, it's much worse now that Eglinton has changed my route's changed, it's difficult, these lights are congested. What, how do we react as a city to the broader effect? You know, we've got, this council's got broad carriage, and it's not just the particular project, but it's now the effect on the overall area. 
Uh, through you, Madam Speaker, so there are a suite of measures which we can use. Uh, so those include things such as signal timing modifications, uh, turning restrictions, traffic calming, those sorts of measures, Councillor. So signal timing I get, but traffic calming and turn restrictions, do they not increase congestion or shift cars around? How are we dealing with the loss of capacity in one spot and it being shouldered on other areas? I, um, through you, Councillor, the, the, the way in which a major project like an LRT modifies the travel patterns in the area, some of that we can plan for, others we have to react to after it happens. I think, uh, and I don't know what the discussion was back in 2009 when this topic came to Council, but my guess is that there was uh, pretty strong thinking that, as the Chief Planner has pointed out, that a significant amount of the through traffic and the localized traffic is going to shift mode to LRT. Um, and also making sure that that corridor is able to accommodate people movement. Uh, we will uh, then look at how we address localized traffic impacts resulting from any restrictions that have been uh, implemented as part of the LRT project. Thank you. Count, uh, Deputy Mayor Minnewong to speak. Uh, I'm fine, thank you. You don't want to speak? At all. He's happy. I think I've made my points. Okay. Um, Councillor Thompson to speak. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I first of all want to thank the staff for the amazing consultation that has taken place for a long period of time. Uh, we've consulted with Crosslinks. We've had the, presidents of Cro the president of Crosslinks in. We've had Metrolinks in. We've had the whole team in my office and varying meeting rooms here in this city hall and elsewhere and so on. We've gone out as, as residents. Uh, we ha actually have a, uh, an advisory group for the Golden Mile Corridor in terms of looking at the redevelopment that's going to take place there. Um, there's a significant amount of development that's going to take place. There's a lot of activity now, whether or not it's the former Warner-Lambert Warner uh, facility and, and uh, the thermos facilities and all, all, along the way. We've had, we are going through a secondary plan a study right now to look at how we can deal with a lot of things. There's going to be new uh, roads that are going to be incorporated in the area and so on. This is a massive uh, redevelopment that's taking place in this area. And it started to sound like the staff were being questioned as to whether or not, you know, they really understood what was going on, whether they knew, knew what, you know, whether or not we had sufficient information. The former councillor, uh, Councillor Bernetti Holland, or Holland, and I spent a lot of time. We were concerned about the lane removal, the impact, and so on. But we also looked at the positive side, which is everyone wants better transit. And there is apparently no way to facilitate it without having some changes to the area. Last Friday, I was out in the area meeting with uh, some business owners there who are concerned about the impact. And we said, we're going to work with economic development. We're going to help to promote the area and so on, because there's been challenges. But that's natural. I think Councillor Cressy's and uh, Councillor Layton's uh, requests on behalf of Councillor Cressy about, can we have development without any, uh, you know, sort of delay or issues and or the actual core construction that's required for development. It's just not possible. But it started to sound as if the staff were being sort of, um, you know, um, uh, the impression was that staff were not being professional, didn't sort of understand what was that they were doing, and or that we as councillors and I myself personally did not get enough information. This body here had this information. We went through it, and as I said, we were concerned about the very things that. Uh, have been raised here about you know the travel time and so on. We want more people to actually use this cross town that we're investing massive amounts of money in and creating some disruption now when all the people move in, whether or not it's on Victoria Park, Pharmacy, a Warden area, Birch Mountain, so on, all the way over to Kennedy. This is going to be a huge benefit to the community. We have spent a lot of time with the staff discussing these things, and we do know who the point people are. We consulted with the consultants and so on, the IBI group and others and so on. This been, it seems as if it's been 10 years in the making, quite frankly, it probably is. It just seems that 
uh, every day uh, there is something that we're trying to deal with there. And there is the, um, the team in place that I'm very confident with and confident in the work and the professionalism that has been brought forward in dealing with this because it's going to have great benefits on the issue is around the, you know, the, the turning restrictions and allowance and U-turns. We had great concerns about that because initially what was being proposed didn't necessarily mirror what we are actually doing here today. There was, um, you know, some no U-turn at all, quite frankly, that was incorporated in the original plans, and we were very concerned that that would have huge impact on the potential of uh, vehicles traveling in the area and so on much more so than um, you know, what we are seeing here today. And so the staff have had a chance to review and, and to have discussions and to use professional judgment. And yes, I think we understand from them that you know, the modeling, and it's not perfect. There's going to be some element where a resident will say, why couldn't they have done a better job? And I'm sure at that point we want to review it and examine it and so on and so forth, because that opportunity is there. But I don't want the impression to be created here today that somehow that these professional staff members and the folks from uh, Crosslinks and others and so on didn't spend an inordinate amount of time along with my office and the other counselors and so on to discuss this issue and look, to look at impact. So I want to thank you very much for your excellent work and thank you for the report that's here today. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Matlow. My, uh, <clears throat> my community, uh, I, can, I can tell you off the bat, strongly supports the, uh, the LRT and wants to have better transit in our city and certainly along the Eglinton Corridor and understands all the facts that we've known for years that there's going to be uh, better capacity on Eglinton and the status quo before the construction uh, didn't, didn't really allow for the functional street that we hope to have in the future. Um, the construction itself, though, has been an absolute nightmare, an absolute nightmare. Um, for both businesses and for residents. Uh, for businesses, I, I, I have friends uh, who I've made over the years who have businesses in Eglinton who have cried before me in my office because of what they've gone through. And people have really lost their businesses over this. It is a reality uh, of, 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 of the impact of the construction. And neighborhood residents have been through uh, experiences where there are long queues of traffic on every street and if you looked at the pictures that I've seen or if you've been to the streets that I visited you will see that they, they literally can't move on the streets anymore and there's cars blocking their driveways that won't budge and they're waiting to get everywhere and there are some streets that have been the winner streets and the loser streets over the years depending on where a left hand uh, turn restriction is and where there isn't one it has been an absolute mess and I say that uh, uh, without rhetoric r really just it has literally been that way for people in the communities. Guys, if you could just tone it down a little bit. Thank you. We, uh, Metrolinks and Crosslinks, uh, there's been a process that we've needed to reform recently where uh, Metrolinks would come and, you know, rather than transportation staff, they would be the ones to come and brief counselors and tell us, you know, what was going on or what they were going to do. But they don't work for us. Uh, they've got different interests. Uh, our staff are here to support uh, both the city of Toronto and, and our community. And, and we've you know, said to them, you know, we, want, we want to hear from staff proactively rather than from Metrolinks or Crosslinks about what they want to do. We had an experience recently, Mike Cole and I, where um, uh, I was just elected for the first time to the western part of my new larger ward, and Mike, uh, uh, for, for, the, for the first time as part of this city of Toronto, is the councillor for Eglinton Lawrence. Uh, uh, right before the holidays, Mike uh, he didn't even have his pictures up on the wall, and we find out uh, that uh, Metrolinx wanted to shut down uh, Bathurst and Eglinton. Mike got in touch with me. The very next day, we held a meeting uh, to, uh, to address this with, with all parties involved. Metrolinx and Crosslinx had actually sent a notice out to thousands and thousands of people about this uh, without even having a permit in their hand. They didn't even have allowance to, to do so. And then they were going to have a meeting that wasn't a public consultation meeting, but an information meeting about something that they weren't even allowed to do already. And uh, I can tell you that even though, you know, publicly, uh, you know, uh, there, there are some suggestions that the mayor and I don't work well together, I can tell you quietly behind the scenes, their mayor was incredibly helpful 
and incredibly supportive. And he and I, along with Mike Cole, all three of us were back in touch with each other every day trying to figure out how to support the community. And ultimately, uh, we arrived, I think, at a good resolution. I want to commend Mike Cole, the, uh, the leadership that he provided, the support that he provided his residents, uh, the pleasure that I've had to work with Councillor Cole uh, for the community. I say pleasure working with him. The experience wasn't always that pleasurable, but the, ple but the pleasure has been working with Mike. Um, to challenge, to champion what's right, but challenge what's wrong. And that's what we did in this experience. And the residents, at the end of the day, felt supported by that. That being said, though, the question by the residents is always, what's next? What are they going to do next? What are they going to do next? And this is a long pattern. Uh, about three years ago, I also uh, caught Metrolinx out in a lie where they, had, they were doing work that they had said to the community uh, at Young and Eglinton uh, that was related to the tunneling, so therefore they had an exemption to the noise bylaw to work late at night. What we discovered later is that they didn't have a permit for what they were doing. It was actually HVAC work, you know those loud vacuum trucks that, that you can hear from a mile wide. And they, they were doing things that they shouldn't be doing. The moral of the story is this. We can simultaneously support transit. We want to get this built. I, I know that Mike and I and Jay and every other councillor along uh, Eglinton will always be reasonable and support things even when it's difficult to make sure that this is constructed expediently and things get moving and to be built. But when Metrolinx and Crosslinx play games and they put their own interests before the residents and the businesses, we're going to take a stand and we're going to push back and thank you to Barbara Gray and all of you for being there recently with us to manage this issue and we're going to work forward uh, with you for as we move forward in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Perks. Thank you. I just wanted to make a couple of comments about the tenor of this conversation, both here at Council, but also at the Infrastructure and Environment Committee. Um, there, there was a suggestion that uh, staff couldn't tell us what before and after travel times would be, and they, 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 they you know, couldn't tell you right now how much congestion there would be 10 years from now, and that this somehow was a failing of the project. There's also been a suggestion that this is going to cause congestion for cars, the, the overall project. And I think both of those are utter failures in the understanding of how transportation actually works. Congestion is not caused by a single factor, road design. Congestion is a two-factor problem, the capacity of the street and the use of the street. If you have a street that is designed to have a capacity of 1,000 vehicles per hour, and it's never more than 500 vehicles trying to use it, it's never getting congested. But if you have a street that's got a capacity of 1,000 vehicles an hour, and every day 1,500 vehicles try to use it, it's congested. It's always the relationship between capacity and use. And as you heard from staff, the capacity in this corridor is doubling. Right now, the capacity is somewhere around 170,000 people. And we have to remember, it's people we want to move. We, we don't drive empty cars up and down the streets so that we can say, look at how many cars we got through the corridor. It's actually the number of people who move that we're concerned about. So today, or prior to the, the, the work being done on Eglinton Crosstown, if you were traveler number 170,001, the road was congested. When this is complete, if you are traveler number 170,001, the road will not be congested. In fact, if you are traveler number 330,999, the road will not be congested. In other words, we know already, without having to do the work that Councillor Min and Wong has asked staff to do, or without the concerns raised by Councillor Holliday, that we are in effect reducing the congestion in this corridor at least until the number of people using it doubles. So I think that's very important that we bear in mind the, these conversations about when we do transit expansion, sometimes on the surface, 
Sometimes when we do transit expansion and we take advantage of that opportunity to make streets more walkable and bikeable and safer. That we're actually not making it harder to drive in the city. We're not slowing people down in their travel. We're making it easier to travel in the city, safer to travel in the city, and faster to travel in the city. And the comments made to suggest otherwise are just counterfactual. Thank you. <clears throat> Councillor Cole to speak. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Yeah, I just wanted to comment because I think this is, you know, the largest uh, transit uh, project in North America. The largest, billions of dollars. And the uh, lessons uh, I've learned, uh, I'm still learning about it, is that there is no sort of uh, one description of the benefits that really uh, makes it clear to people what the real results are. You know, we talk about we build transit. Remember, as we build transit, we also increase density because because of trends that our official plan says, yeah, you can have more density. So in some cases, when the density overtakes the transit's capacity, so you're at point zero again. So let's not forget that in terms of the impact because, as you know, subway station, oh, yeah, you can have, you know, Young and Eglinton. You can have all the density you want, 50 stories, 40 stories, because you've got the subway there. So sure, you've got a subway, you're going to have the east-west line running, the north-south line. So as much as you can say, well, yeah, we, and it's true. I mean, we, uh, in the perfect world, the uh, transit investments reduce uh, congestion, take cars off the roads, that's, that's a given. But the other fact, the reality is there's also increased uh, density. So you've got more congestion, more people, more mayhem. You know, try and get on the subway at Eglinton and Young. You want to uh, risk your life? Go try and take the subway this, this morning at 8 o'clock. I dare you to try and get on the subway. See how many cars you have to wait for. You want a, an, a, an adventure? Try and take the, the station, get on the subway. Because of the con <coughs> density, congestion, try and walk the streets along Eglinton. You want to risk your life again? Try and walk from Young over to Kiel on the sidewalk, wherever you can find a sidewalk. But remember, these projects, like the Crosslink, this has gone on for 10 years. This is not six months. 10 years of construction hell, traffic hell, dangerous places to walk, drive, whatever you want to do. And there's incredible achievement, too. The, the tunnel's already been dug from Black Creek all the way to Laird Drive. I think the tunnel's complete. They've got a work train running on it. So there's great achievement, and our staff is really caught in the middle because they don't really make the decisions. It's not Metrolinx anymore. That's gone. It's Crosslinx, a consortium, a private consortium that basically is in charge of the largest construction project right now. Not Metrolinx anymore. It's the Crosslinx people that make the decision. So our staff is caught between the shopkeepers, the residents, the motorists, the cyclists, the pedestrians, crosslinks, uh, city councillors, they're trying to manage all this stuff. You try and manage. Somebody says, well, uh, do we have some one person to call for all this? Well, we probably need a thousand people to call to manage each intersection. In fact, we should have a traffic warden at each intersection. Maybe three or four at Young and Eglinton to manage people walking, uh, cars turning. Uh, we've got cops there all the time. I like to see the policing bill, the uh, duty, paid duty for, for what we've spent on that project. But then, on the other hand, we have no control because it's a provincially managed, funded, operated project. So if you want to look at things to come as the province takes over the TTC, well, welcome. Take a walk, walk along the you're going to see you lose control. You have no say over anything because they pay the bills, they make the decisions, they decide everything. Like we tried to get maybe uh, 
some residential over the land at Young, at uh, Eglinton and the Allen Road. Well, Metrolink says, no, we're in too much of a hurry. We can't put residential over uh, the proposed uh, you know, affordable housing. Uh, it'll slow down construction because we're not in charge. So staff is trying to do the very best in a very complex, difficult situation that is really a challenge. And that's why I know there's a motion by Councillor Fletcher, I think, on compensating people too. You know, I've had a hundred stores closed. This is supposed to be job creation. Imagine the hundreds and hundreds of jobs we've lost along Eglinton with small mom and pop businesses that shut their doors because nobody would dare go to Eglinton because they're going to risk their life. The uh, stores uh, are closed. Councillor Cole, Anyways, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Do, do we have any other qu uh, speakers before I sh No? Okay. On the item, on favor, recorded. Councillor Crawford, please. Councillor Robinson. The item is adopted unanimously, 23 in favor. Thank you. Page 2EY 2.3, direction report for 1197, the Queensway and 8 Zorro Street. Councillor Perks. Do you have questions to staff? Uh, this is, so actually, um, no, I don't have questions to staff. Fair I just need. have a quick remark that I want to make. All right. Okay, so uh, this item yesterday, uh, Councillor Grimes uh, rose to make an amendment, and I held it because I had no explanation of what that amendment achieved. Then today, city staff came and said, well, actually, we have to amend the amendment and put forward another one. So what Councillor Grimes is going to put forward is just fine. I endorse it. Please vote for it. I do want to make a comment, though, to planning and legal and clerks. In future, when we are getting amendments because of settlement offers and, and changes to, to settlement offers and all that, what would really help me is if I got a supplementary report with a signature on it that gave me some context about why, in this case, we're doing the parkland dedication differently from how we typically do it. There's a perfectly good reason. C Councillor Grimes and the planning staff and legal staff have done a great service to the City of Toronto. It's just I had no way of knowing that because I had no documentation, no explanation, and no, no context. Thank you for your time. Thank you. <coughs> Councillor Grimes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So, as Councillor Perk stated, the new motion came from uh, staff today, so I think I have to withdraw the first motion I placed yesterday. Is that correct? And move the one, um, they have the new one. Do I have to withdraw the first motion? No, it never got placed. Never got placed? No, because I held the item. Yeah, we're just treating it as a revised. Okay, so there's the new revised motion with the Parkland dedication. Staff uh, asked me to move this today, and Councillor Perk's been briefed on it. We're all okay. Okay, so. On the amendment, recorded vote. Councillor Thompson, please. The amendment carries unanimously 22 in favor. Item as amended on favor, carried. Uh, T2.4, 
Councillor Matlow, you held the item down. Do you have questions to staff at the direction report? I don't have questions. <clears throat> okay, does anybody have any questions? Okay, Councillor Matlow. I have a motion. Okay. The motion that, uh, that I worked on with the city solicitor um, and um, there, there's a number, as you can see, and more coming uh, applications for uh, various uh, uh, developments, including infill developments in the Davisville Village neighborhood. This is uh, just for Councillor Robinson's attention on the apartment neighborhood side. And, um, and uh, there are genuine and considerable concerns that we've determined through the Midtown and Focus process about the cumulative effects of these infill projects. So we want to make sure that, that the consideration of these appeals are not done in isolation to the other. Okay, so the amendments on the screen, do we have any questions? On the amendment, on favor, carried. Item as amended, on favor, carried. I think we have time for one more. Councillor Thompson, page three, T2.18, construction staging for 281-89 Avenue Road. Explain Questions? My mic. I have no questions, actually. Does anybody have any questions? We don't need to have questions. Do we? No. No, I think we're fine. Councillor Thompson? To speak? Yes. You want to speak first? Yeah. You, so, you, you yeah, held the item Yes, down. I agree. Yes, thank you. Um, so, Speaker, I have a motion, and uh, staff, I'm going to ask the staff to put the motion on the floor, please. Uh, yeah, it's there. Um, I've consulted with the local councillor. Um, this is a matter that uh, we would like to advance. Um, we've chatted, spoken with staff. Staff are in concurrence, and the um, motion is to delete the one that's coming from committee. Uh, and then to replace with the uh, staff recommendations. That's uh, from item one to seven. And that uh, this creates an opportunity for this matter to be dealt with. The local councillor had uh, definitely some concerns and he'll be speaking to it. And I think you also have a couple of motions and so on. The staff are in concurrence that uh, this uh, matter is in order, in order to move forward. We have had, uh, over the number of years, we've seen, I think the numbers that I had was about 141 of these types of applications have come forward and we've approved all of them. Uh, the local councillor uh, will speak in a moment, but I just simply wanted to ask uh, members of committee to support the staff recommendation that uh, I put forward and to delete the um, recommendation that came from committee. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Matlow. I have a couple of motions. Uh, may, I, may I begin to speak and the motions will go up as I... No, we have to have them prepared. Okay, we'll hold the item down. Okay, we just have one motion to add and then we'll recess. Okay, what, who, who's got the motion? Councillor Cressy. Councillor Cressy. Mm -hmm. We'll put it on the screen. So this way we can deal with it. And I can start speaking as it's coming up. This is a, a motion without notice. It is it's coming from myself and uh, Deputy Mayor Madam Long, Chair of Striking. It is urgent because there is a, currently a council seat vacancy on the Board of Health and it's to allow Councillor McKelvey, who has expressed interest, to attend the upcoming board meeting before council sits again. Thank you. On favor, carried. Recess to two o'clock. <laughs> 